all the stuff you realize that's really important in life or like your experiences and relationships. It's not, there's more to life than just your bank account, even though, you know, I think Kanye said it best. It's like, well, careful. <laughs> <laughs> fair, fair. <laughs> Welcome back to Macrodosing. It's Tuesday. Happy Thanksgiving week. It's November 21st. And we've got a feast of an episode today. A really good, deep topic that we can get into. Um, it was proposed to me about two weeks ago by Ben Mentz. He suggested, hey, PFT, I've got an idea for a great episode of Macrodosing. Let's talk about the second act and let's talk about the life and times of Ben Mentz. And I thought, what a perfect episode for Thanksgiving week. Um, so hopefully you guys out there enjoy it. We're going to get into some stuff, maybe, maybe a lot of untold stories about Ben Mintz, maybe some things you might not know about the man, the myth, the legend, the superstar that is Ben Mintz. I've been watching Blackbird on, uh, on Apple TV. Great show. With the assistance of 3G. It is a good show, isn't it? Mm -hmm. The dude is the, the main character in it, not the serial killer guy, but the other guy, he looks like, like a, like a Ken doll sometimes just like. He he doesn't look human being. Yeah, he is. I mean, he's ripped. Yeah, he's ripped, and he's just like his hair is always like perfect. And then um, that's got to be great though, because it's based on a true story. So the dude who it's based on is probably pumped, like, really pumped. Yeah, like, yeah. Sweet, they got this guy to play me. And Tough that, break for the serial killer, though. No, I would be happy if I was a serial killer because that guy, what's his name, Paul Hauser. I great don't know, actor. I don't know the actor's name. He's a good actor, though. Great actor. He was awesome as Richard Jewell yep. mm -hmm. in that one movie. Um, I think he's actually a stoolie. Oh, really? I think he, I think he might be a fan of many things here at Barstool. Hey, what does that mean? What does stoolie mean? What does that mean? Like oh. a, a fan of Barstool Sports. Oh, just like of everybody? Yeah. Yeah. I just know that. Okay. Right. Yeah. It's like if yeah if if you consume any piece of content at Barstool, just be like, oh, you're a stoolie. And long time story. Don't you dare say it's lame because the last guy who said that was fired. Michael, Dude, and also Michael Rappaport. Shit lame. Yeah. Shit Did lame. you see what he said recently? Who? Rappaport? No. I saw it. So, Rappaport has been like an anti Trump guy mm -hmm. for like he's been ragging on it. I saw him at the protest with Donnie when the indictment. He's been a super anti Trump guy. And he literally That's how you know he's, he's flipped. Cool. Like he was like total lib and he's flipped. He oh, just because like, Trump is very um pro Israel. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so he, he's a, a MAGA guy now? <laughs> yeah, he's flipped. I, I don't think don't he's a MAGA. Politics, dude. But that's a, insane. He's not a MAGA dude. Wow. I mean, that, I know he's MAGA. I think he's just out on Joe Biden, is what it sounded like to me. Gotcha. No, How? it's just that he's Joe so, Biden's like, super pro Israel. It's, what both, is his... it's like Rappaport and Trump are both saying, like, if you're a college student and you show up at like a pro Palestine protest, you should be like, kicked out of school or whatever or like yeah, these are the free speech guys right yeah yeah interesting so, so okay well that's i did not see that coming that i know would go crazy would, twist would do a full switch i don't know i don't check that source i, I don't in a way he's pro trump bro yeah the hey, i saw the this. clip no i saw the clip and it wasn't that he was like super pro trump he was talking a lot of crap about trump saying all kinds of stuff he was just like He's better than the alternative was pretty much what he said. Better than Biden. Yeah. yeah. It, it wasn't like pro-Trump. It was just anti-Joe Biden. I well, um, we're back, baby. Uh, it's great to be here on Thanksgiving week. Like I alluded to before, we've got a great guest here in the studio, Ben Mintz. Ben Mintz fresh off of a poker tournament. Now, this episode almost didn't happen. It came close to not happening. I protected you guys from this because, excuse me, I protected you guys from this because I didn't want anybody to be worried about today's episode but yesterday i received a text from ben Mintz at saying, 10 a.m i was trying to be punctual yeah, with it yeah yeah you let me know you said there's a chance that you might not be able to make it for this interview for the for the ben Mintz episode and uh, full disclosure we were still going to do the ben Mintz episode <laughs> even without you here um because we had this planned on our calendar yeah and so I, I could it wasn't the, 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 so what happened was i, w I went to san antonio uh, kind of your old neck i guess you were an austin guy your mm -hmm. old neck of the woods to play the south texas poker championship and uh there were like 890 people and i made day two and the money with the good stack and so i thought the final table was supposed to be sunday and i found out sunday morning that if i made the final table it was monday night at six yeah. so i sent pft kind of a panic text at 10 a.m yesterday just being like uh like i super appreciate y'all having me on but 
it, there were 90 people left going today too. I was like, if I make this final table, I'm going to have to zoom. We're going to have to figure something out. And I ended up getting 22nd out of 890 for 4,250 bucks. So great effort. Yeah. And I got done at 11 or midnight and I'm back here. So well, thank you I, for I feel like we got back, the best. Rich. I feel like we got the best of both worlds here. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for flying back. I could have used 130 grand though, but it you know, would have been you, nice. You yeah. Do? Were you, were you sponsored by anybody in this tournament? Or uh, was this just uh, purely for fun? Uh, they, I've got basically the rounders card room in San Antonio hit me up, want me to come to kind of do some promotion and social media stuff. And so I was like, you know, Sounds good to me. Yeah. Made a trip out of it. Went to the Alamo. I saw that on picture. Friday. Yeah. Can you yeah. walk me through the picture that you took at the Alamo? Can we pull it up on the screen? And maybe can we drop it? Can we send it to Arian too so that he can see it? Um, because Mintz, Mintz was talking about going to the Alamo, looking to see if anybody had any connections at the Alamo. And I told him, I think a lot of people told you that the Alamo is a very underwhelming exhibit. You get in, you get out. But then you told me that your namesake yes. died at the Alamo. So it was important to you. To go, yeah. To and dude, they have, they have, they have stuff up everywhere for them. They have like a painting inside. They had a whole exhibit talking about, uh, his, his story. Uh, he was famous. My name is Benjamin Milam Mintz. I'm named after Ben Milam, who apparently was like my uncle. And wait, wait, what do you mean? Apparently was your uncle. Oh, and he's like, I mean, I guess it was 200 years ago. So is it an uncle at that point? Oh, okay. So you are, a, are a descendant. Yes. Of, I'm a descendant. Of, yes. Okay. My grandmother's maiden name was Milam. And so I wanted to go check out if there's anything for him. So he died in the battle in like early December when the Texans took it over from the Mexicans, not the one in February where everybody died and the Mexicans took mm -hmm. it back. But it was a real famous thing where he was going around getting volunteers and says, who will come with Ben Milam to San Antonio? Okay. And he rounded up a bunch of volunteers. They went in there, they won it, but he died in the battle. But he's still, but he's still like, there was stuff everywhere for him. It was cool. I, I had a big moment with it. I, I was kind of, kind of geeking out. So, Arian, can you take a look at that picture that Mad Dog just dropped in the chat here? This is Mincy outside the Alamo. He was taken, was this Friday? Yes, yeah, Friday. On Friday. All right, so, Mincy, it's a great picture. You're wearing, you're wearing your Ole Miss gear um, in front of the building. And a little blurry. It's a little blurry. How many pictures did you take? I ended up taking a few on the trip, but I, I don't know. How, why, did, why did you decide on the one that's... That's I just had clear. somebody. I just had somebody take it, and I just put it up and didn't think anything of it. When you put it up, though, are you at the point where? I mean, I'm trolling a little bit. Yeah, yeah, it. yeah. I mean, I'm trolling a little bit. You know what? You're, I when I saw that, I was like, Mincy knows what he's yeah, doing. Yeah, I mean, this it's picture you know the look. It evolved that way. I, the first one with Jack McCarthy at the Texas Bowl was not planned. Yeah, but you know, eventually. Mm -hmm. I'm just kind of leaning into it a little bit. Did you feel bad about throwing Jack McCarthy under the bus when you when you tagged him photo credit at Jack McCarthy? Did you know that you were throwing him under the bus? Kind of. I, yeah, I thought it was funny. <laughs> I thought it was funny a little bit. It was funny. He leaned, He didn't mind. Yeah, it was funny. Um, all right, well, tell you what. We're going to get into the Ben Mintz thing in a little bit, but let's uh, let's just start off the show, see how everybody's doing. Arian, how are things down in Houston? My bad, I was muted. Uh, we chilling, man. It's it's beautiful weather. It's like, it's like 50, 60. I think today's a little hotter, but um, yeah, got a little overcast. Family, uh, we all going down to San Antonio actually. To uh, my mom stays in San Antonio, so uh, we going down there for Thanksgiving. So um, uh, after we done with this, we might stay another day, but we leaving on Tuesday at the latest. Very cool. And are you actually excited about Thanksgiving? Yeah, yeah, right. super excited. What was that? What was that? Well, because you're uh, you were looking forward to Christmas more, right? Why? 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 Why are you so? Uh, you know. Focus the harness, then you can't. There's no duality in the life of PFT. You you can't you can't you can't enjoy two holidays at the same time. Like no, I can't. No, you can't. The, that shit weird as fuck. No, you you celebrate the holiday and then you go on to the next holiday. You move on. I disagree wholeheartedly. I feel like you're robbing yourself and your family of so much joy. It's well, your here's fault. the problem. Okay, so as we discussed last week, I I tend to be a little bit upset that we don't give Thanksgiving its due. Mm -hmm. The real issue is like. I went because it's, it's a trash ass holiday. It was whack. That well, now so you're whack. confusing me. See, that's what I'm saying. You, you it's are a Thanksgiving holiday. Hater. You just it's said you whack. loved it. It's your whack as fuck. No, it's not. It's, what do we celebrate, Billy? Thanks. What we're, we're, what we're we giving thanks. We're giving. We're celebrating thanks. colonialism. Hang on, hang no, on, hang on, hang no, on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Real quick, real quick. That's not the argument. White guys, tell me what it is. But you, I'm just, I'm just genuinely confused because a minute ago you said, "Yeah, I love Thanksgiving. It's great." And now you're saying it's trash. 
no, the holiday is trash. But like, I love anytime my family can come together and and spend time together. I love it. In this society, the only time we allow people to do that and take breaks from their jobs day to day are holidays. So whatever it is, I'm I'm happy. I'm happy and I'm and I'm and I'm and I'm grateful for it. But the holiday itself is whack as fuck. Turkey's trash. Like it's just whack. It's just whack ass holiday. It's like it's whack ass holiday. You want to know how many times? Thanks. I I love Thanksgiving. You can give thanks. Celebrate every three hundred sixty five. It's true. Days, that is true. Uh, uh, a year, bro. It's not a. T- it's not about giving thanks. It's, it's about being you are, grateful. You're market. I'm grateful every single every day. day. Is you've the been. Day you've been. Yeah. You've, you've been marketed to. It's okay. No, no. I want to be. I want. I'm a little extra grateful on Thanksgiving. I'm not. I'm pretty much the same. And that amount of grateful. No, because it's like usually you have your family around you, and you're like, oh, like. Thank, I'm so thankful for all these people who are here, who I love, and I'm thankful yeah. for the bountiful meal I it's have in special. front of me. And it just it's like a, yeah, it's a everyday thing, everyday thing. You don't have to you don't have to wait till November to be thankful. I promise. Try it. Yeah, but Aaron, this is this is also kind of elitist of you because there's a lot of people out there that are unable to celebrate with a big meal like that all the time. It, they they save, mm-hmm. they plan out this trip to go see Spend their family. Long. And spin it's like zone a, is unreal. It's a special moment for them. The no, spin I zone is unreal. When I was growing up, I couldn't go see my grandparents all the time. It was like, okay, you get one meal where everyone either comes to town to you or you go visit them and you go all out for this meal. And I love things. You want how many times I've thought about pilgrims or Native Americans on Thanksgiving as like the, the basis for why we're eating this meal? Probably zero. Like it's that's that has nothing to do with why I appreciate Thanksgiving. I like being around family. I, I agree. Like same reasons why I, Christmas is the same way. I do not think about Jesus one time because of Christmas. It has nothing to do with the, with what we're actually there for. I'm there for family. That's what I'm here for. Yeah. Like that's I, that's why I love holidays. I love holidays because it allows people to take a break from the day to day nine to five. Fuck that shit. Enjoy your family and enjoy the week, bro. That's, I love that shit. So, so here's why I don't like Christmas encroaching on, on Thanksgiving's turf. You go to Target, you try to get some placemats, some Thanksgiving-themed placemats for your family who's coming over, and you can't even buy Thanksgiving-themed placemats what? because it's all Christmas shit what? already. Karen, you're and it's the, full it's, blown. Yeah, I'm out on tar- <laughs> Target is satanic. <laughs> Well, it's that say, is true, it's, it's, but not for the reasons you're saying. Target is, is satanic. I'm I, I'm agreeing with the people that bring their cell phones, their like little buddy into Target. They're like, hey, get, get a video of me walking up this shirt that's got a unicorn on it because I'm about to blow people's minds. That's what I'm doing, but I'm going up to the, the fucking placemats, and we got Frosty the Snowman all over the shit. I just want some with like some nice leaves or a turkey is that or a cornucopia. Would that be too much mm-hmm. to ask on a placemat mm-hmm. that they're selling the week before Thanksgiving? So why don't no, you order it moving, online? We're moved on. We're moved on to Christmas before Thanksgiving's even here. So yeah, why don't Target. You, why don't you I'm plan now, ahead and order it online instead of taking it out to good people at Target? Sometimes you want to go brick and mortar. Yeah, it's good. Mm. I like walking out with. It's nice going into a store. Yeah, it's a. It's a it, we've missed that experience. Yeah, you're adventures. You're, you're a cyber right. human, Aaron. You only connect to the world through your screen. I, I like will, to go out there and press the flesh with the people. I, I will gladly take that and wear that badge proudly. Y'all Fuck remember that. going to so, malls? Yeah, uh, malls. Are crazy awesome. shit mm. happening at malls and seeing it live is insane. It's awesome. What kind of crazy shit, Billy? Just like what you kind know, of crazy like, shit have you seen at a mall? No, I just like Black there's always Friday events stampedes. like. Yeah. Black Friday stamp. Like today, I walked to the store and I saw a car crash, and that was insane. I love like, see, who doesn't love seeing car crash? No, I'm not it's saying, so but like dope. it was like, whoa, like what's going on? Like <laughs> reality. Fuck? Like I'm just like I'm about like going out there and seeing it. You know? Yeah, y'all, y'all spin zone is hilarious. I'm with I, you though. It's not a spin zone. We need it's to get absolute. Thanksgiving. It's, it's went, day in the you, shade or you went, day in you the went sun. From, you went from how come I can't get uh thanksgiving play a doormat to you don't get out at all there and you're not a, like it's wild this is wild it's just good well, to go to a store big t's right it's good to go to the store and- you mean to tell me eric that in oh, chicago oh, Ill- you mean to tell me eric in chicago <laughs> illinois there is no store you can go get a thanksgiving doormat on placemat Placemat. Placemat, excuse me. A Thanksgiving placemat. There's there's not one store because it's flooded with Christmas stuff that Eric cannot get a Thanksgiving yep. placemat. I'm calling bullshit. Okay, well, I went to Target. Where else am I supposed to go? I maybe you know what? After we're done here, 
I'm gonna try Home Goods. There's a Michaels. Home goods Maybe Michaels lit. has. There's something. There's something. What well, you blaming it on the establishment? There's plenty of other establishments, my brother. I'm blaming it on woke society. You. You know what else? I'm woke. Bring, bring really Christmas about. on. <laughs> bring it on, baby. We also Thanksgiving is sort of like pagan holiday for the harvest. We're we're also celebrating the harvest traditionally. Like that's mm-hmm. that's why that whole fall aesthetics is coming on. Like why there's a cornucopia. Yeah, it's because yeah. we're celebrating the bountiful harvest. That's why they celebrate up in Canada, even though they didn't have any pilgrims. Yeah. And- Speaking of pilgrims, I have a direct ancestor, Thomas Rogers, who came over on the Mayflower, signed signed the Mayflower Compact. Oh, really? Contra- Wait, was it the, yeah, the Mayflower Compact. It was some contract they all signed. So I, I pretty much only think of pilgrims on Thanksgiving. Yeah. <laughs> Low key. And Indians, and Indians. Yeah, so when you came over, when he came over, did you, do you know why he left England? Um... I don't. I know that actually it was a, a father and son. The father died on the trip over, but the son survived. And then uh, 13 generations later, uh, my mom came along. Wow. So, yeah. Now, Weren't I don't think. Puritans? Yeah, I don't know if we can call the pilgrims like straight up colonizers, like a lot of the settlers, because they were more like religious refugees. Yeah. And when they showed up, a lot of the Native Americans had already been like wiped out by smallpox. Like a a, a wave of smallpox of a smallpox had already like spread around from just fishermen off the coast. Mm-hmm. So that's why when they arrived, they were like, "Oh, this land seems pretty empty. Like there's like no one here." When in reality, there were tons of Native Americans there. Just a lot of them had had already been hit by disease, which and, is really sad. And uh, didn't the the Vikings were the actual real people that discovered? North America. Yeah. They were the first European people to yes. discover North America, and right? Which the populations were higher back then of Native Americans, so they drove them out. Yeah. Native Americans beat the Vikings in a fight. Yeah. They really? That's a movie yeah. I've always wanted to say. Someone needs to make that movie, Vikings versus Native Americans, because that would be insane. Yeah. No, you can- The Kirk Cousins battle. You can yeah. read the Viking Chronicles, <laughs> and they, they talk about like meeting the Native Americans and then getting- um eventually driven out of the land they're like this isn't worth it that's yeah. top tier joke pft i think they Thanks, called Aaron. them yeah, yeah. I, I, I know so i know so eric gets all the hate pft gets all the credit wow PFT Vikings, is more reasonable yeah eric sounds like a little you know a little <laughs> eric's, whiny. eric's a little whiny man eric's a karen eric's a karen <laughs> i just need a fucking thanksgiving placemat all right I, I, <laughs> go get one Karen. i'm i'm gonna try that's where i'm gets where i'm going after work today but I'm why wait so late though? Like it's 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 Monday, brother. Like yeah, Thanksgiving's not till Thursday. So this is me that, thinking ahead. That's see now, now see, you you're making a worst case for yourself because you like this is Thanksgiving. All the Christmas stuff is it's too early. It's too early. Well, yeah. it wasn't too early for Thanksgiving, or else you'd have been participating in the festivities already, decorating the house, getting your shit ready. But you three days out, Thanksgiving about hasn't happened Thanksgiving. yet. We should be so, we should be looking forward to Thanksgiving. That makes you no know what sense. Thanksgiving's almost like a trap holiday. It's like a look Christmas look ahead spot. It's a look ahead yes. spot. We're all thinking about the big matchup against Christmas. And guess what? I'm not going to be able to cover the spread because I don't have a fucking placemat for Thanksgiving. Mm, so Michigan kind of this past Saturday. Yep. Go into Maryland, sleepy, 11 a.m. kick. Yep. You got Ohio State the next week. You got to take care of business. Yep. I and I'm I'm trying to they take lost? care of business and I can't. No, they didn't cover though. Oh shit! They, they were dicking around for a little while. Gotcha. Yeah. So listen, it's these type of uh, games where they'll jump up and bite you. So all I want bite me Thanksgiving. All I want is just a Thanksgiving placemat, and I also got to go out and buy the turkey fryer and all that stuff. So I got I got a lot of errands that I have to run after work. <laughs> it's, today. it's your fault, though. <laughs> you, you, I got you four have, days until the holiday. I feel like that's but, a good. Okay, can we admit that you have procrastinated? Yeah, but I mean, when else was he's I been busy? To get this? I've been pretty and busy. I don't Speaking care. of him being busy, can can we talk about? Good segue, Billy. <laughs> can we talk about it? What are we talking? Yeah. about? I just want to say I want to give a round of applause for PFT's amazing performance on College Game Day because it was. Ex- Is there a? Can we rewatch it? I actually didn't even watch it. Oh, you did. There's a lot of clips. You didn't see the Tennessee thing, Aaron. What did no? 
Oh, oh wow. Oh no. The so I figured Arian had not seen it, but the way he responded in the group chat made me think he had seen it. No, I responded because everybody's like, "Good job, congratulations." I was like, "Oh, you know, like I, it was a big deal." So I did. I, I, if it meant something to you, it meant something to me. You know what I mean? I appreciate that. You're a good friend. Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, yeah. So um, I was I was lucky enough to be invited to be the guest picker on College Game Day on my alma mater's campus, James Madison University. Um, they were undefeated at the time. They're still ranked in the top 25, but unfortunately they lost to App State. Um, but I went to JMU. I graduated there in 2007. And um, our football team at the time was FCS, so Division One AA. We won a national championship when I was there, by the way, which was incredible. Um, and then gradually over the years, they've improved as a program, won another national championship, I think, in 2016. And uh, we made the jump up last year officially to being an FBS program. So we're playing with the big boys in the Sunbelt Conference now. And uh, the team has been incredible. Our coach, Kirk Signetti, is like an outstanding head coach. He's probably going to get some buzz. He's going to get some interviews from some Power 5 schools. I still think that if West Virginia needs a head coach, they're they're probably going to go to him. And he'd have a, a very hard time saying no because his dad was the coach there. And he's got a lot of ties to West Virginia. He was born there, I'm pretty sure. Um, and he's like, he comes up at the Nick Saban school where he, he worked for coach Saban for a while. And he's a lot like him in my opinion. Um, so he's probably going to get some offers. I hope he sticks around JMU, but he's done a great job making this program into like a very respectable football program in a short amount of time. Now, we, we did have some great coaches along the way, but he's definitely taken it to the next level. Um, so we're undefeated this year. We're not eligible for a bowl game. We were undefeated and, uh, not eligible for a bowl game because in your first two years, you can't um, – you have like a postseason ban. They don't want to have teams jumping up and jumping down when they're good and bad. So all this discussion around JMU football resulted in college game day choosing Harrisonburg uh, over Corvallis, Oregon, which was an elite matchup that they had last week, um, to do college game day, the show at. And uh, I thought when they made the announcement, it was last Saturday, and I thought there was like a 40% chance – that they might ask me to be a guest picker because I, there aren't that many JMU uh, sports media people that are, that are known for supporting the Dukes. There, obviously I think Charles Haley went there. Uh, great player. Um, we've got Gary Clark. We've got a, a few people buzzing around, but um, I thought there was like 40% chance they might ask me. I didn't know if the ESPN thing was going to get involved in that and, and make it uh, a difficult ask, but uh, Monday morning, wake up, haven't heard from anybody Tuesday morning comes around. And I'm like, well, maybe there's a chance that they ask me nothing. And then by Wednesday, I just looked myself in the mirror. I said, you egotistical fuck. Like how, how, how big is your ego to think that that college game day was going to ask you? It was like a very humbling moment for me. I was like, well, I need to go back to the drawing board right now because obviously like that was a delusion of grandeur that I had. And then Thursday evening, I get a text from the producer and Pat McAfee asking me if I wanted to come to the show. And I was like, yeah, absolutely be an honor. Um, so we flew out on Friday night and uh, it was awesome. I mean, the the quad was packed. It was, I think, 26,000 people yeah. at the show, was which was awesome. the biggest college game day ever. Um, I talked to Kirk Herbstreet for a little bit, talked to some of the other guys, and they said this is by far the best crowd that we've had. It's insane. It was like the entire school was out there and it was, it, there was a moment for me when they brought me down those stairs and did the walk and talk. That was, it did feel surreal, like an out of body experience. And we're going to get into some of this with Mints. I don't want to take all your, all your, oh, all no, your you, you go right ahead with your game day, my friend. But, um, <laughs> but I, I had, I had this feeling like my life is the Truman show at that point. Like this is everybody just playing a, a big prank on me? Like what is going on right now? Cause never in a million years did I ever think that I would be in that situation. Like I was on school, I was on campus there at school. And, uh, in 2007, I graduated with, I think a 2.8 grade point average. I didn't know what I wanted to do for my life. I just was an English major because, uh, it required only one math class. And that's why I decided <laughs> on that as my major. So I had no idea what I was going to do until, you know, well after I graduated and, uh, to be back there in that environment, um, as the guest picker on game day was, 
it was a uh, a truly surreal moment for me. A lot of nostalgia, a lot of emotion came over me that I didn't think that I was going to have, but it was it was hard not to. Um, and then it was just a, a fun experience on the show. I missed that kick, but it's probably for the best that I missed it because I did um, accidentally promise that Big Cat would match the two hundred fifty thousand dollars to charity, which I shouldn't have said. Uh, it just it just happened. We're addicted to saying that we're going to match charity contributions. So um, I missed that kick. Aaron, you don't have to look that kick up because it doesn't matter. It was a bad hold. And it was well, Billy. Billy, tweeted you were the closest, it, so. though, out of and all I, the people who have I done it in the past. Choked. Like, because yeah. yeah. I think no one has made it this season, right? Uh, one, one kid made it, made it on the oh. second attempt. Oh, OK. I think I would have made mine on the second attempt, too. But I, I haven't kicked a football in a long time. And it was I was going up there cold. Not to make an excuse. Also, it was windy. Also, the hold was bad. Um, but <laughs> I, I thought the best kick of the day by far was the Duke dog. The mascot tried it. And in like a full mascot outfit with the mascot pants and shoes on, he came pretty close. That's impressive. That was really impressive. Yeah. So yeah, it was a, it was a blast being on the show was so much fun. And uh, once I got up there on stage, I felt like I wasn't nervous anymore. I was nervous before the kick. And then when they got me on stage, I just felt like normal. Let's have a conversation with the boys. And it was a, it was a great time. So I'm, I'm very thankful. I got to have that opportunity and, um, I appreciate everybody's support. So thank you guys for supporting me in that. But it was, damn, I'm, I'm getting like emotional just talking about it right now because it, it did feel in that moment like this gigantic, I was swimming in a gigantic ocean of nostalgia that was just like hard to process in my head that it was real life. Um, so yeah, it was a blast. It was a blast. Are there some James Madison alumni that are more famous than you or are you... Are you close to the top of the pack? I don't even know how to describe. Like, I, I, I guess I'm like a niche celebrity, niche celebrity. Jim Acosta went to James Madison. Oh, I got the nod over old Jimmy A. Yeah. Okay, suck it, Jim. Yep. <laughs> um, and Lindsay Sarniak, yep. ESPN anchor. I used yep. to love watching Lindsay Sarniak on uh, George Michael Sports Machine. Mm-hmm. She was really good. But yeah, we don't, we don't have like a laundry list of – a list uh, celebrities, especially like in the sports world, to choose from. Yeah. So, um, I was I was glad that they that they reached out. It was very cool. Well, uh, but yeah. but to, so I set the stage, and Aaron, what they asked me to do was pick every single. Or they had a list of I think nine games that I had to pick the winner of. And so we go around the panel. Everyone gives their pick, and you get like five seconds to explain why you're making this choice. So one of the games they gave me was uh, George Bulldogs, Tennessee Volunteers. And I said, I've got a, I got a coworker, host podcast with him, and he's the biggest University of Tennessee fan in the world. And he told me this week, PFT would mean the world to me if you would pick my Tennessee Volunteers. And so I'm going to do that for him. Arian, this is for you. I'm taking <laughs> <laughs> the University of Tennessee Volunteers. And then I, I think at that point, Lee Corso looked at me and he goes. That pick stinks. <laughs> nobody, I, I don't know how many people in the world got that joke, but certainly nobody on stage got it because they were all like, "Oh, that's so nice." Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's funny if you ju if you're just a Tennessee fan who's never heard of this podcast. Like, it's funny enough if you just know like Arian and you know the back and forth of whatever over the years with he in Tennessee, and that he just you know he you want Tennessee to win, I guess, but like it it doesn't make or break your day. But yeah. the to get both layers of the joke, <laughs> there's probably like 10,000 people in the world who got it. Yeah, well, shout out to those 10,000. It was worth it. I've been looking everywhere for the clip. I can't find it. I know. I was I was going to try and see if I could clip it, and then I didn't want to get like sued by ESPN for clipping college game day. So yeah, you said like, that. Would they really do that? Yeah. Yes. They would sue, like actually sue. Are they try yeah. to get you to take it down. I, I did hit up the producer to see if yeah, I can get I the full clip. It. because I. So I told my mom... Um, that I was going to be on TV on Saturday. And so she was like, oh, I can't wait to watch you. This is so this is so cool. And uh, my mom tuned in and she saw me miss the kick. Aww. And then she <laughs> turned the TV off because she thought that was thought my that entire was appearance. Aww. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm trying to get the, the entire clip so I can show her on Thanksgiving. I'm like, no, there was Aww. like a little bit more to it. So she just basically tuned in and got embarrassed about her son being a shitty kicker. And then- I'm getting <laughs> something to the act real quick. I'll be right back. Okay, all right. Oh shit, we just got cocked. What's going on, Mincy? I got a big cat and walker come to the act right now. Okay, so all right. I'll be right back. Well, good luck. It'll be quick. Did right. your mom record it on a VHS? On VHS? 
No, yeah, my, my, mom my grandma a is a big record on VHS person. No, whenever she, there's a specific event, she did not record it, unfortunately. So I'm going to try to get her the clip so that we can watch watch the entire thing. But yeah, I, I think I said, I think I said the thing about Arian Foster, and then Lee Corso was like, "That pig stinks. He must be a pretty good friend." And I was like, "Yeah, he yeah, is. yeah, he is. <laughs> <laughs> He's a good." You friend. didn't feel you didn't feel inclined to explain who I was. No, no, I just wanted to just keep it rolling. Wait, like, did Lee Corso know who know who Arian was? Lee Corso, God bless him, all time legend. Barely knows who Lee Corso is. <laughs> yeah, I don't and think it's he sad. Would. He should I know have Kirk. Well, I actually got a little bit of funk with Kirk because when I when I came out and said I took money under the table, he he had an issue with it. There was a bunch of people that had an issue with, it, but he was one of them. And I just I just remember thinking like, what a sucker, man, because like you you get paid off of eighteen year olds. That's crazy that you don't want to get these kids paid. But, yeah. Yeah, the one thing I'll say about Kirk is he's got a great dog. Mm -hmm. Great oh dog. My God. His dog so cute. His dog Ben is the best, the absolute best. I I tried to steal Ben, and that's not going to do much to sway this guy. It's not. Yeah, it's true. Uh, true. But <laughs> but the nice thing about Kirk is he's. I mean, he's already he's, been stolen, so fuck it, man. It wasn't better at this point. <laughs> he's taking Coach Corso kind of under his wing and just making sure that he's doing all right and and hangs out with him and and you know they go back and forth on set and kirk will lead him into if he loses his train of thought kirk will lead him back into what he's he's trying to say it's is he like, out is he like out of it he's like he's going well a little bit he seemed like he seemed friendly enough and nice enough when i was on set i have seen a couple moments where he you know goes in and out sometimes and he has to be kind of put back on track but um he, he was so good on tv for so long and i think that he's still like he still does the job well he just needs like a buddy to keep him keep him focused, and I actually really do appreciate the relationship that the two of them have. It it, it should make you like Kirk a little bit a little bit more. Oh, I don't dislike him. I just thought it was a sucker move. Like I don't I don't know him enough to like him or not like him. It's just he did some sucker shit. It's, it happened. Everybody does some sucker shit every now and then. Yeah, P hand up. I do. Yeah, PFT. Did no. Lee Corso understand who you were? I don't think so. For sure not. I don't okay. think so. Because um, he did not get your jokes. That's fine. <laughs> like, I, I, maybe maybe it's for the best that he didn't get some of them. <laughs> um, but no, I I don't think he really understood. Desmond, I think he knows me. I'm pretty sure he does. His wife and I, we, we've talked a couple times, and she's mm. like a very funny person on Twitter. And I think that Des and I might have gotten back and forth a couple times too. Um, Reese, Him as well. Him as well. He has something to say about me too. Oh, Des did? Yeah. A lot of what a lot say? of motherfuckers did. They was like, because this was that this was in the era. Not to take away from your story, because it's a gorgeous story. I'm happy for you. Um, but it was in an era of like, it was not cool to talk shit about the NCA. Like, if you did, you were seen as like a rebel and outcast. Now it's open season, right? Like it's 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 very commonplace. But it was in the it was in an era where if you talk shit about the NCA, it was you were frowned upon. Like these kids, they give kids opportunities. And so when I came out, I said, like, I'm talking about Gary Payton. Like, these are just the ones I remember. Kirk Herstreet. I remember Des uh, Desmond Howard. Uh, what the fuck his name is? Oh, like, a lot of them cats. It, I remember. It, it was just like, their sentiment was like, oh, you snitching. Oh, you snitching. It was like that. Yeah. And so, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, it was a completely different era. Because the, the entire premise of game day being at James Madison on Saturday was a giant middle finger to the NCAA. Like that's why they were there, because oh, really? the NCAA wouldn't let JMU into a a, a postseason bowl game. Yeah, so oh, they, wow. they it's things have changed quite a bit. Yeah, huh? interestingly enough, man. Yeah. Also, if you're a Beavers fan, if you're an Oregon State fan, you were very upset that game day was not on your campus in Corvallis. They've never been there, and this was a big matchup that you had. I understand that, but at the same time, you have to think logistically with everything that goes into setting up college game day. It's way harder to get all that shit to Corvallis, Oregon, than it is to get to Harrisonburg, Virginia. So I don't even know if they would have been able. I'm serious. Like they bring in like a hundred, two hundred people. They've got massive sets that they, they that they stage. Um, it's way harder to do that in Corvallis than it is in Harrisonburg. I think that more than anything had had to do with their choice. Like airports or what? Travel? Yeah, yeah. Let's see. What, what's the uh, big T? Can you look that up? What's the closest airport to? Corvallis, Oregon, and how far away is it? It'll be Canada. I mean, I assume they have one. Well, it's not. Is Philly. Corvallis really just in the middle of nowhere? No, Oregon? I think it's, they have one. I took a, I took Canada, a, I took a visit there, uh, an official visit. 
Uh, I think I think Salem airport. airport is 28 miles. Eugene is only 31 miles from there. I didn't know yeah, that. Yeah, they're, they're wow, really they close. Yeah. I don't know if they could fly into Eugene Airport with all the equipment that they have. That's the thing. Because also, I'm pretty well, sure they have to drive they, some of it out in the truck. Yeah, I mean, they, they probably put it on a couple trucks. But they fly into, like, Knoxville's not a big airport. Yeah, but they. Yeah. I think they probably drive, too. Like during the week, and to get I'm sure to some of it. I don't know. Yeah, I think they've got these big semi trucks that they drive there. The Northwest is the only region of the U.S. I've never been to. I got to oh, get out there, dude. You would love it. Yeah, it's great. Seems nice. Vancouver for sure. That's not the U.S., but I've heard great things about BC. It's beautiful out there. Hey, but um, congratulations, man. I know how that. I know how that feels. It is like a very nostalgic feeling coming home you know to where you spent so many years dreaming and yeah. uh it sounds like you had that experience this year man so good on you bro yeah thanks it was it was very cool very cool also i think i might be the only game day guest picker that talked about where he got arrested on campus but that was a fact <laughs> that was pretty I, sick i was honestly i was i was staring at the place where i got arrested on saint patrick's mm -hmm, day yeah. you've told that story now, here yeah, yeah so i had to say it were you causing a ruckus or did you just happen to have a beer in your hand and they were like you're underage neither one i was simply walking back from a party on saint patrick's day and <laughs> i had i had a green like ireland soccer jersey on i had probably like some green like temporary hairspray in my hair I had very clearly been out celebrating St. Patrick's Day. I was walking back at my guess would be three o'clock in the morning, two thirty in the morning, on this on the sidewalk by myself, <laughs> and I was on the phone, and uh, a cop just pulled up next to me, and he just started giving me a sobriety test. I was not stumbling at all at the time. You, you, you know what? Bullshit. I don't blame the cop. You know why? <laughs> there was a small chance you could have been a leprechaun, and he could have been rich. That's very funny, Billy. That's a good joke. I'm gonna go boom. <laughs> No, no, but like Fucking you were looking. Boo. I'm just saying there was nah, a, there was a chance. Take that there was L. a chance. Hold I on. was way skinnier then, yeah. And it's before I hit Big my growth spurt. Pot of gold. You gonna yeah. keep you That's gonna keep, keep your foot on the gas? All huh? of their money just <laughs> by arresting underage kids, and then did you have to pay like a fine? It was like a seventy-five, eighty-dollar fine. And in Virginia at the time, I don't know if they've changed the laws since then, but the the state law was. Uh, it was like public lewdness. So it, it was either intoxication slash swearing in public was the charge because it's illegal to swear in public in Virginia. So um, that's what they got me with. And then I just paid the fine and left. And that was it. Well, after I sobered up, I paid the fine. I saw this article, dog, uh, recently that was um, there's this small town. I forget where it is, but there's a small town where that their whole funding is like public uh, shit like that. So like they'll 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 pull people over and stuff like and one of the 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 and the judge that resides over it mm -hmm. is like one of the collectors of all the money and so it's like a super um, conflict of interest but they just be taxing people like a motherfucker out. Huh, Mincy, is that what is that what New Orleans like? I've always assumed that uh, police officers in New Orleans that they're they're looking to ticket out of state people for well, acting up. So the the NOPD stands for not our problem, dude. That's like mm -hmm. the NOPD. So what they do now is the ticketing, the camera stuff is how they get you. They put the cameras up on the red lights and then they just send them in the mail and gouge you that way. Because I'm really at a point where I think you'd have to work to get pulled over in New Orleans. I think I heard something that was like 30 or 40 DUIs in the whole city a year or two ago. There's like a low shortage. It, There's like a shortage of cops. In New Orleans? There's like a big shortage of cops. Like I feel like it, you have to would really work hard to get pulled over in New Orleans right now, I think. What it's, about just fucking up on Bourbon Street? They they keep a few more cops over there, but uh, yeah, it's uh, I think the 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 last I heard was they were supposed to have two thousand officers in the NOPD and they have like seven or eight hundred, so there's a little staff and, shortage. And they probably. have a lot more serious crime to worry about than just drunk tourists on Bourbon. Yeah, Street. Yeah, they don't encourage that, but they got to keep the drunk tourists. They got to they keep the drunk tourists safe on Bourbon Street. Is the, the problem? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wasn't it just recently crowned the murder capital of the U.S.? It, it's it's up there. It's definitely uh pretty pretty high per cap per capita. It's pretty it's pretty uh pretty high. Where I lived, I still I lived in the uptown area and still felt you know real safe there. What about the horses? They got I feel like New Orleans leads the league in uh in police horses. All in the quarter, they're yeah they're everywhere. Why why do we why do we still use police horses? I mean, I guess they feel like they can like get around with. Uh, when streets are shut down, maybe I don't know. It's I mean, like it's intimidating, if, but I mean, I feel like you could a use a scooter. Presence. But you could yeah. use like yeah. a scooter or something else that's probably a little, you know, more uh, better logistically. I also say. think it's like a honeypot where you'll see a bunch of drunk people, and then 
one of the drunk people will try to pet the horse and they're like, boom, arrested for assaulting a police officer. Like half baked. Yeah, like half baked. Like half baked. Yeah. Is that, are they technically police officers? Yeah, because if you kill a police dog, I think it carries a pretty high charge. Would they, like police could you get the, the death penalty for killing a, a canine? Let's go to Google. That would be uh, that would be wild if you could. Where were you raised, Mintz? Because I know I'm from Monroe, Northeast Louisiana. Okay, now I I read a list somewhere that was ranking Monroe like one of the worst cities in the U.S. No offense, I just want to see I want to see if I can find that because I was shocked. Maybe it was worse. City. Produces a lot of funny characters. I can tell you that. Oh, I know it'd be a. Um, yeah, Monroe, Louisiana, named most dangerous U.S. city. How long ago was that? I think it was a few years ago. 2018. Okay. See? They're evolving. <laughs> Getting better. They're, they're fixing up downtown. Yeah. They got a new mayor. Things are a little okay. better. Yeah. Yeah. Did you, uh, I mean, did you witness a lot of crime growing up in Monroe? I, I'll admit it. I was a pretty sheltered public, I mean, private school kid. So, okay. I mean, Monroe was like North Monroe was safe and South Monroe had a lot of issues and Okay. You know, I'm not saying I went down there some. I'm not saying that, but I, I admit I was probably a little. I kind of wish I'd gone to public school. To be honest, I felt like I was like real sheltered going to college. Yeah. Well, I mean, the public schools in Monroe probably are different than like I went to public schools, but I grew up in an area with pretty solid public schools. If Monroe's named the most dangerous city in the U.S., maybe the one in Northern not, not a public school no, you want to go to. Bad. Okay. Um. Yeah. So. I guess I'll wrap up the story with college game day. It was uh, it was a blast being back on campus. Bummer that we lost the game, though. I thought we were going to come back and win it there at the end. It was close. It was a very close game. A wild ending. That crazy touchdown, ending. the two-point conversion to get it to OT. Absolutely crazy ending. And then we were about four inches away from winning the game entirely because they fumbled the ball through the end zone, but the ball had just broken the plane. Can I ask you a question? And you're you – JMU people are not wrong for bashing the NCAA. It's a nonsense mm -hmm. organization generally and in this specific scenario more so. Um, once that play went to review. Yep. I said we lost. There was a 0% chance yep. that, that that was getting overturned. I don't know if someone made a call down. I don't know what happened. If that was called a fumble on the field, I think it would have stayed a fumble. I like, agree because he kind of turned his back to the camera yeah, a little bit. Yeah, it was when it extremely close. Yeah, I think I think that no matter what the call was on the field, that was going to be upheld. Uh, but, but when it probably when it didn't replay, help. Correct to have spent weeks bashing the organization that uh, then yes had to make that call. Correct. So when it goes to replay, I, I turned to Ebo and Max and I said, oh, "We're fucked. We're not going to get this. Zero percent chance." But it was still a great comeback, and I had a, I had a blast uh, watching the game, especially in that fourth quarter. Would have helped if we had hit our, what, 34-yard field goal that we missed earlier in the game. But, you know, alas, not meant to be. We're still, we still should play for the Sun Belt Championship, but they're not going to let us do that because of the postseason ban. Um, and now I, ha I just have to root against a bunch of teams so that there aren't enough bowl-eligible teams so that JMU can get into one. Seems like that is more likely than not, though. Yeah, I'd say Isn't about 60%. Isn't Colorado not bowl eligible? They're not. They're not. They're four and seven. So you could like Barstool should set up a bowl between Colorado and JMU, but not like a real bowl, just like a, a scrimmage. Just a fun a fun bowl. Like yeah, like a, a Barstool bowl. Yeah. <laughs> we have like. one of those. We do. Yeah. I know, I know, but like just like an extra one. There's a Barstool I hope, bowl. I hope James Madison gets the New Orleans bowl. I've heard all kinds of rumors they might get the NOLA one. I mean, if that happens, I will be there. Next Saturday, week. December sixteenth, eleven a.m. kickoff. I will be. It up. I will. You will have to twist my arm to drag me to New Orleans, but I will do it for the people, and I'll go out and uh, yeah, I'll have have a fun time, eat all the gumbo, come back. Also, real yeah. quick on the police dog, police horse. Uh, if you murder a police dog or police horse, it is a class E felony, but the judge usually punishes you way harsher than the minimum five. Uh, two to five years because they are technically officers and it carries a higher weight with law enforcement. I'm with Arian on this one. A, a dog should not be ordained as a police officer. Is He's not, but it's, it's a higher felony. Like it's not manslaughter or murder, but like in Texas, you can get up to 20 years for it. The dog doesn't know that he's a cop. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Texas, they love giving dogs ranks. The uh, Reveille, the That's dog cool. at Texas A&M yeah. is like the head of their, 
Corps of Cadets or whatever it is. It's the <laughs> highest ranking member. They have to salute Reveille? I, I know the dog is the number one rank above whoever heads up the whole thing. <laughs> that that sounds about right. Oh, I love Florida, that. You can get to 15 goofy. years. But usually the crime of killing a dog is in conjunction with other stuff like, uh, you know, uh, Grand Theft Auto, or in one case, there was a kidnapping, and then they set the dog off you, then the person shoots the dog, and that's usually where you get the the higher charge. Okay, so if, if you want to make that argument, can a police dog also be held liable to a greater extent if they're corrupt, or if they fuck up somehow? Because I know that, I know that cops... Uh, if you have to hold it, that precedent to the humans first. What I'm just saying, in theory, if a cop gets red-handed caught like taking bribes, then mm -hmm. they get the book thrown at them, right? That's like a big thing mm -mm. where it's like a, a, a public servant misusing their office. So if a, if a police dog it's is accused treats. of malfeasance, then the dog should be punished to a, a higher extent. Yeah, it takes treats. Yeah, like if you just hand them a bunch of treats and you're like, <laughs> don't attack me. Yeah, look the other way. Yeah. Yeah, then that dog, that dog should go to prison. I think they that. definitely get the pound. Yeah, the dog should have to go to the pound. <laughs> How do you think police dogs get treated in the pound? All the pit bulls just attack them. Not good. Not good. You don't want to be a police dog in the pound. <laughs> no, they get humped all the time. In the, it's a bad spot. In the grooming station. Do uh, if a police dog dies, do they give it like the funeral with bagpipes and yeah. the big procession and all that stuff? That is deserved. Yeah. They do deserve. Yeah, oh my the bagpipes. God. Yeah. Also, police horses. Think about back in the day with like <laughs> I just war love horses. The look on Arian's face. Where he's like, war horses are insane. Oh, yeah, like how many how many horses died in the Civil War? I'd like to know. It's probably an I don't, insane. I don't amount. think I don't think they had cat like as big of cavalry as uh, a lot of European battles. But World War One. Have you ever read the book uh, War Horse? Yeah, uh, yeah. They they turned that into a movie as well. Yeah, dude, that book was insane. It was actually crazy. Like neither side would purposely try to kill the horse in okay. battle it was like an unspoken rule like we don't kill the horses we're here to kill each other okay nine hundred seventy thousand people died in the civil war how many horses do you think a thousand no maybe twenty thousand because i think they probably killed a lot of horses for for OTE. food too so, i'm gonna go with sixty thousand i'm gonna say fifteen thousand none of y'all are even close 1.5 million. Oh, wow. Oh, my fuck. God. Really? That's estimated, yeah. Yeah, I mean, horses are a larger target than a dude. So it's a lot It's a lot easier to kill a horse. If you had asked me, like, how many horses live in the United States, I don't think I would have said 1.5 million. That uh, does seem like an insane number, but that's... How that's many horses do that? The, the feral horse population is a problem, and no one wants to deal <laughs> with it because everyone loves horses. Where's the, where's the problem, Billy? Yeah, out west in the Great Plains, especially on public lands, the feral horse population is like a threat to bison populations, and they're kind of a nuisance. So, are you saying that we need to hunt horses? God, I damn. think we may need to sterilize horses. Currently, there are seven point two million horses in the United States of America, and I think like two are feral. And that's like, and that's from two two thousand million. Oh, I thought you said there was only two feral horses. It's just two no, real no, problem two horses that yeah. are, that but you are know decimating the all the the tasty I, grass for the bison. I've seen a feral horse before. Like when I was in Bosnia, I think like we came across this horse just completely alone eating trash. It was just <laughs> eating plastic bags filled with trash. And damn. I was like, damn, this guy needs to find a stable. You it's know what else is horse. insane? Guess where the largest population is of camels are in the world. Oh. Donnie, I told you this one. I told Flor you this one. Florida. Australia. Really? Yeah, they import camels from Australia to like the Middle East because there's a huge feral population of camels in Australia and you can hunt them from helicopters. What does feral Wait, mean? Wait, what? Yeah, you can you can What does feral mean? Feral means once domesticated but then revert reverted back to their wild um form when they like got released into the wild so like if a dog gets loose and then just starts living alone off the land it sometimes goes feral or like in the case of pigs feral pigs in the united states huge problem like millions of millions of dollars of property damage uh and they like like think of a pink farm pig they slowly morph into a wild boar when they go wild something about their 
genetics starts expressing once they realize that they're not, you know, pigs for slaughter anymore and they have to survive themselves. It's a crazy concept. I kind of want to see like a study on humans who go feral. Yeah. Um, Billy, I always thought that feral meant just wild. So you're saying like if an animal is born in the wild, like if it's, no, a, no, no. If it's a, the son or daughter of a feral pig, are they not also feral? I think they're also feral. I think it's captive, like a domesticated species that go feral. Gotcha. Like if, if they like have you would never descent. refer to like a, a, a cardinal as a feral no. cardinal. No, no. Like a naturally but, occurring species like that. I know that there are a ton of feral, actually they're wild horses, uh, ponies actually on Chincoteague and As- actually they're on Assateague Island. And then every year they send the fire department out there to round up a bunch of the ponies, pin them, corral them, force them to swim across the channel from Assateague to Chincoteague Island in Virginia. And then they pin them up and then they sell them at auction. They just straight Th- up- Those are feral. They're not wild. No, they're wild. So they're free. No, they're feral. No, they're wild. They're wild. No, no, no. they're not they're, wild because they're the, the descendants. Horses- they're the descendants of horses that came over in like the 1600s during a shipwreck and they've lived out in the wild for the last 400 years. Right. But they're not a wild horse breed. They're technically a domesticated horse breed that went feral and now run wild, but technically they're feral wild horses. You see in central Asia. It's interesting to see in the, Mongolia. the verbiage we use for animals. So like feral, I'm just reading the definition one that escaped from a domestic or captive status and is living more or less in, as a wilder. So there's like free, free animal. Yeah. All right. Credit to Billy. Um, I looked it up because they always refer to them as wild horses on Astatigue. The official explanation from the National Park Service is the wild horses on Astatigue are actually feral animals, meaning they're descendants of domestic animals that have reverted to a wild state. Billy's right. Credit to Billy. But wild horses are crazy because they look prehistoric like look up uh uh in like mongolia and parts of russia i want to say central asia kyrgyzstan maybe there's like like actual wild horses like these are the types of horses that like the mongols domesticated and rode across eurasia oh wait so they were domesticated at one point billy interesting what so wouldn't they be feral no 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 these are the wild horses that got domesticated but they're no longer wild no, they're wild. No, be- these ones are Billy. Wait, now I'm confused. No, no. So these are the ones that the Mongols never domesticated. The ones that are still running wild. Billy, I'm know. Billy. I'm very confused it's... because the definition you just gave me for the feral horses on Astatig Island sound a lot like the very definition you just gave me of the Mongol horses. No, no, no. These these are. Pr- Perzawalski's horse. Right. And these are the ones that never got domesticated, but were probably of the same stock that the Mongols rode across. Hmm. But you just said they're, they come from the same stock as the ones that were domesticated. Dude, this isn't a competition. Okay. I'm just saying. Yeah, the, it is. I'm the, rooting. The horse, <laughs> the horses are like some of the most, like they almost look like zebras without stripes. They're like, they're wild. It just yeah. sounds to me like I just I, I just proved that they're feral. Well, it, you know, it says the only true wild horses live in Asia. The Przewalowski horses of Mongolia have never been domesticated by anyone. Yes. Okay. Those All are right. what I'm talking about. They are units, too. These are some big ass horses. Ooh, they they're furry boys too. Yeah, I like that. How you spell Przewalowski? It's uh, tough. It's how how it sounds. P R Z E W A L. S K I. Przewalowski. PRZ? Yeah. PRZ. Sounds um, Polish. All right. We're going to get into Mincy and the second act in a second. There's one Pause. more topic I want to bring up because we didn't talk about it. I'm, I'm kicking myself that we didn't mention this last week, but I guess the information came out on Wednesday, maybe after we'd recorded. Oh, yeah. Um, the Diddy lawsuit. <laughs> yeah, dude. Have you guys read about the Diddy yes. lawsuit? Yeah, dude. I've heard about it. I ain't read the actual lawsuit, though. All right. So um, Diddy's ex-girlfriend. Cassie, a famous musician. Cassie Ventura. They have they reached a settlement on Friday. Which is like a day after the news came out. One day too late for, <laughs> for Diddy. Like, if you're going to resolve this case, you should have resolved it one or maybe two days beforehand. 
Uh, so Cassie Ventura alleged that Diddy enticed Miss Ventura into a lavish, high-paced, and drug-fueled lifestyle. And it claimed that Diddy abused Cassie for many, many years. And there were some explosive allegations in that. Uh, she said that Diddy forced Cassie to participate in numerous sex activities with other men. Things went so bad that Cassie had to check herself into rehab. In a statement given to CBS News, Cassie said, After years in silence and darkness, I'm finally ready to tell my story and speak, half, speak up on behalf of myself and for the benefit of other women who face violence and abuse in their relationships. There were some, uh, some crazy allegations in there, including but not limited to the point that Diddy allegedly blew up Kid Cudi's car. That, yeah, that was what? the craziest thing. That was the least crazy thing. Well, well, that was just the thing. I didn't know that Kid Cudi's car actually exploded. Yeah. And it exploded like not long after he was telling Cassie, like, I'm I'm going to blow up Kid Cudi's car. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's completely nuts. So... Um, and that happened a while ago, so that was that that was kept under wraps. You would think at some point Kid Cudi would be like, uh, "Yeah, so uh, P P Diddy tried to assassinate me." Yeah. So what ha So I'm gonna quote from the root here. The tabloids then reported that Combs threatened to kill Cudi out of revenge for ruining his relationship with Ventura. Um, they were. She had a relationship with Cudi in 2011 during a rough patch with Combs. After Combs found out about the fling, he allegedly went on a rampage, beating Ventura, lunging at her with a corkscrew. Following this, she she fled to Cuddy's house for revenge. As a result, Ventura claims that Combs directed his rampage toward Cuddy. In February 2012, during Fer Paris Fashion Week, Mr. Combs told Miss Ventura that he was going to blow up Kid Cuddy's car and that he wanted to ensure that Kid Cuddy was home with his friends when it happened. Around that time, Kid Cuddy's car exploded in his driveway does not seem like a coincidence and Cuddy kind of confirmed it a little bit through his publicist that yeah so here here's the follow-up story kid Cuddy confirms cassie's story that uh diddy blew up his car just gotta allow this on the uh ad block here former bad boy recording artist cassie has filed a lawsuit against her former boyfriend among the allegations or that Diddy allegedly blew up the car of an artist that she was seeing at the time. Kid Cudi has confirmed her version of events. According to the Huffington Post, in the lawsuit Cassie filed, she stated that Diddy purportedly threatened to blow up Kid Cudi's car. Shortly after that, his car allegedly exploded in the driveway of his residence. In February 2012, said that he was going to blow up his car. We already heard all this. And um, in a statement published by the New York Times through a spokesperson, Kid Cudi stated, this is all true. Well, that shit is insane. That Cuddy's pulling like, or that that Diddy's pulling like, Casino and Goodfellas era like dude, exploding cars on yeah. people. I guess that's he, not even the worst thing. What's worse? What? Wait, what? Did you hear the part about how he used to hire male prostitutes yeah. to do terrible things to so, Cassie? So he's a cuck though, too. I guess that would that would make him a cuck, right? If he's just hiring male escorts to to fuck his girlfriend, like multiple. Yeah, like he would he would hire these guys and be like gangbang my girlfriend and I'm going to watch. What's the mentality behind that? Like I don't he, know. he's the most powerful person, one of the most powerful people in the world. Uh he controls a shitload of stuff going on in entertainment. And so he has so much control in all facets of his life that he wants somebody to make him feel like less of a man. That's like his kink now. Or I, yeah, I guess he would feed them all drugs and then would just like force them into a sex orgy that would last for days. She she was like, I was fucking. She was like, afterwards, I'd have to like go to the hospital. Like, she'd just be banging multiple dudes for days. That's insane. Um, this came out maybe a month ago, but I think it's almost been pretty much confirmed that Diddy put out a million dollar hit that got Tupac killed. Like, a dude came out. I think he admitted to either being the one who killed Tupac or like it was his goons who killed Tupac. And he's like, yeah, we did it because Diddy offered us a million dollars if we killed him. Also, I forget if I said it on this show or not, but there was a recruit. I wish I could yeah. remember who it was now. It was Diddy's son at UCLA. No, 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 no. I no, remember no. that. Uh, yeah, that's part of the story. But there was a recruit who said that G he was being recruited by UCLA when Jim Mora was the coach. And Jim Mora told him who killed Tupac. And at the time, Diddy's son was playing at UCLA for Jim Mora. 
yeah, yeah. but then there's also the story where Diddy, so uh, Diddy's son went to high school near my high school a, a little earlier than I did, and he got recruited to UCLA. And then during off-season training, the uh, head strength coach, Aloso, who was also the guy, I think, who need the Dolphins player on the Jets, the Jets strength coach. Do you remember yeah. that? And basically he said to uh, Diddy's son during conditioning drills, I don't care if your dad's here. This is UCLA. I'm going to treat you just like I treat everyone else. And then after the practice session ended, Diddy went to the coach's office in the school's athletic facility, grabbed him and tried to beat him with a kettlebell. Yep. Yep. There's a lot of weird Diddy stories coming out. Wale said that he was hung over a balcony because Diddy was like jealous yeah. about Cassie at one point. Um, 50 cents. Hilarious. Cause 50 cents always on Twitter. When some, when something bad about P Diddy comes out, yeah. he's, he's always trolling the fuck out of him on Twitter. What did he say? Um, he, well, I think this time he just like retweeted it and he was like, these accusations are making you look crazy. Diddy. <laughs> and he, he said, and then Damn, came like, that he put out the hit, he was like, "You're going to jail, Diddy." Ha ha ha! Better be careful what he says. They might be singing, "I'll be missing you" to him. Yeah. There you go. There you go, man. Yes, nailed it. But, but uh, yeah, crazy shit with Diddy. The, crazy. It makes crazy the shit. it makes the videos of him and Justin Bieber look really disturbing. So I saw I saw that you included that in the email. Can you tell us what the video with Justin Bieber was? So Justin Bieber, they had a whole shoot about how he was doing 48 hours with Diddy. And there's just videos that like, like Diddy was promising him cars, like all this stuff. And then there's another video like later where Diddy is like pressing Justin Bieber about like, yo, why aren't you contacting me anymore? Like what's wrong? And like, you see Justin Bieber get super awkward and like, I don't know, just like, there, there's just a ton of weird videos of him and Justin Bieber that allude to like something may have like Diddy may have like done something to Justin Bieber. Diddy always gave off weird vibes too. Like he was a superstar, but he was a producer. But I don't know how much of the actual production he was doing all the time. Like they would just take they would take samples from popular songs, and then he he would have super talented rappers that would rap with him. And then he was like, you know what, I want to be a rapper too. Have we reached the conclusion that that Diddy is not a good rapper? Is that crazy for me to say, or would people agree with me on that? Well, I mean, like Dr. Dre did the same thing. Like Dr. Dre is known for producing great beats, and then whenever he raps, he would usually have someone else write his verses. Okay, I didn't know that. Yeah, about Dr. Dre. Yeah, so like Mad Dog's waving at us. Like Eminem no, lights went out. Lights wrote for off. Dre. Okay. Um, I think like Snoop wrote for Dre. Eminem wrote for Dre. So, I mean, that's like in the scheme of things that Diddy has done, him not being a good rapper is uh, one that, of the least. Right. That's not, that's the least. Yeah. Of, but I'm yeah. saying like he was always like making himself the center of everything. And that album yeah. was it, uh, Puff Daddy and the Family. Yeah. That that one that was like 1999, 98. Mm -hmm. That was a great album. That was an yeah. awesome, awesome album. But I feel like the people that he surrounded himself with were way more talented than he was from a rap standpoint, but he did make himself the center of attention around all these super talented people. Yeah. It was always like a very weird power dynamic with them. Yeah. Like, is he the one who made those beats? Cause back when uh B I G was rapping, like, yeah, the, he, he rapped over incredible samples, which I don't even know if rappers can do these days. Cause he used to just take old songs and pretty much just take out the lyrics and then add a beat under it and turn it into a new song. Yeah. I think now, that's harder to do or maybe more expensive to do back then there. I don't think there were all these rules about samples. You could kind of just like take it. I, I think that back then it was easier to do because there were no algorithms like searching new music that was coming out to see if something was familiar. Yeah. You know, like somebody had to hear it and then tell someone about it. And then they had to like go to court to prove that this was like directly taken from them. Yeah. Which it, it wouldn't be hard to prove, but maybe, I don't know. There weren't as many rules yeah but those were great beats like uh juicy or uh hypnotize mm -hmm. the, like that's a a very i don't know what the song is that it samples but i don't know that's i mean 
is he the one who started doing that? Just like taking these old soul R and B songs and turning them into rap bangers? No, like hip hop has always been. They they it's always been about it's that. always been about that and sampling other things. He did it probably a little bit more shamelessly, and he was more commercially successful than a lot of people. Yeah. Um. So we talked about him, but he would just like straight up steal like, "Can nobody take my pride? Yeah. Can nobody hold me down?" And then obviously, "I'll Be Missing You" was that's just a sting song. Yeah, singing the police. Uh, so the um, guitar part for "Mo Money Mo Problems" also a hit song. Yeah, Diddy. We, Aaron, were you ever a fan of Diddy growing up? Not really. Um, it, I was. It's because I was jaded. I was, you know, I grew up like loving the West Coast vibe, and like that few, you know, I was young and impressionable, so it was like always pop, and I. I I didn't really listen to Jay Z until I was until I was like two thousand nine. Yeah, I, I didn't really fuck with none of them cats because I was I was rolling with Pac and them. Uh, you can get from being young, but yeah. uh, was never really a fan of Diddy like that. Um, I don't I don't know. I don't really I don't know. There's a lot of lot of, lot of accusations, man. I stare at shit like that. I don't got nothing to do with me, dogs. It's just fucking wild that he blew up Kid Cudi's car. <laughs> That's some you crazy know what, shit. You know what's insane? That from my frame of reference, the only P. Diddy I ever listened to was like, I'm coming home, dirty, uh, Diddy, dirty money. Like, hello, good morning. Do mm-hmm. you guys remember those songs? I'm coming home's a good song. Mm-hmm. You missed the era of Lil' Kim though, Billy. Yeah. Lil' Kim, I, I saw a video of her the other day. Still looking pretty good. Shout really? out Lil' Kim. All right, let's go. Shout out Lil' Kim. Um, all right, the Tennessee Minute. Big T, what happened this weekend? I took Looks I took like the Tennessee Volunteers. I took the Tennessee Volunteers to support my good friend and diehard Tennessee fan, Arian, and the, the Volunteers let me down. The first play was great. Well, Tennessee Minute is apt because the first minute was awesome. True. The first, like, 15 seconds yeah. was incredible. And then they scored three points in the last 59, 45 or so. Yeah. It was a, it was a great start. I was feeling great. Amazing start. <laughs> and the best start you can have. For a moment, you thought, we're going to do this. So I would not have thought that except for the fact that the line made no sense. And even it was announced before the game that both of our starting offensive tackles were out. And the line went down another point. It was UGA minus eight and a half. I was like, th- I mean, it made no sense at all. Right. And then the first play, we bust a 75-yard touch. I'm like, okay, they knew something. Like, I don't I don't know if we they knew we can run outside. I don't know what it is, but they knew something. And then just – I mean, those mm-hmm. teams aren't close. So, like, it, it's not – Right. It's It doesn't, you know, sting that bad. But Yeah, I think you were realistic going into this weekend. George is a wagon. Yeah, I mean, they're – Tennessee's flawed. They, they messed around for seven or eight weeks, but now they're – I mean, Carson Beck is nasty. I think they're probably going to win the national title again. Probably, yeah. Um, I don't know if you caught this, but after after Corso told me that pick stinks, I said, Joe Milton can throw an orange 120 mm-hmm. yards. And then I think Herb Street goes, that's important. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it turns out it's not. It's not. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm I'm disappointed with Joe. I can't believe I I stuck my neck out for that guy because he, you know, hadn't had the season we hoped. He but uh, been fun. This is a transition year. Next year it's Nico time. Yep, it's gonna be awesome. All right. Well, that's the Tennessee minute. Um, you guys want to get into some some Mincy stuff in the second act, and and, o- and the first act, and the first act overall. I'd like to. I'd also like to tie this in with just the idea of manifestation, right? Mm-hmm. Just speaking something into existence. And a lot of people believe in that sort of thing. I don't, I don't right off the bat, I'm going to say like, I don't think that it's completely bullshit because I think if you have a goal that you repeat enough over and over and over again to yourself, a lot of times you are telling yourself subconsciously to focus all your energy on whatever that goal is. Mm-hmm. So you spend more time, being productive towards that end goal. I don't think that there's anything secret about just saying I'm going to win the lottery and then eventually you're going to win the lottery. But if you tell yourself you're going to win the lottery every morning, then you're probably more likely than other people to play the lottery every single day. Yes. Which would maybe increase your odds slightly. But if you just, I'm not 
going to agree with people that say like you can will anything into existence because there's a lot of different variables and challenges and, and starting points that people would have to overcome. But um, there's yeah. something to be said for like having a goal and then speaking out there into existence. But you also have to take action. If you're just yeah. speaking it, nothing's going to happen. But if you're, you know, if you're speaking it, thinking about it, and then taking some steps in that direction, yeah, then it, it will come true. What I do think is bullshit are vision boards. Remember that was big like a year ago mm -hmm. where you just put all the things you want on a board and just like hang it up in your house. Mm hmm that is some new age bullshit in my opinion and it'll get there yeah so people would like they're putting like a tropical vacation and like a rolex watch on like a board and i don't know or a brick watch yep there you go yeah there you go mincy um what about you guys rest of the crew do you guys believe in manifestation there's that old saying that christians always be saying uh, <laughs> faith faith without works is dead yep something like that I just always like, well, why just just do the works? Yeah, it's reasonable. I don't know. No, I don't believe in manifestation as far as like uttering things into existence, but I do believe you can, um, you can work towards a goal, and sometimes you get lucky, sometimes you don't. I think I think the best life advice I've ever gotten is things are. Dis disassociate your. Uh, uh, expectations from it things are mm -hmm. the only reason i do heavily believe in manifestation is because of like all the athletes that practice it and like for example conor mcgregor is comes to mind because remember when he knocked out jose aldo he was in warming up for the fight talking about how exactly he's going to do it how he dreams about doing it that ex exact same uh combo he was just imagining himself doing it and then he did it and isn't I that just like, practicing yeah he that that's being prepared no no but but it's it was more like he he was like imagining it over and over again and he'd predict how he'd stop fights and like but think about the millions of athletes all across the world who think that and then never comes true it happens all the time but you just don't hear about it because nobody was like man mm -hmm. i id manifested some shit bro <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think i think it definitely does work to a certain degree no i mean like when when if if you have trouble falling asleep before sporting events like the number one uh advice is to just like envision yourself like you know if you have a certain play you're gonna run that game like envision yourself being successful in that play and just envision the success i think there's a lot of people who you know imagine grandeur grandeur and like try to get rich like people who want to be super successful when you're talking about athletics there is a different like being prepared and visualization i i think visualization does help some people because if you if you think about it enough then you are more confident and more comfortable and it's almost like since you've taken those mental reps you aren't thinking about a lot of outside stuff. So it's it's not, it's kind of the same as practicing. It's, it helps organize your preparation mentally. I would argue visualization is manifestation. Okay, so no. No, manifestation, what? to me, manifestation no. has always implied like some sort of spiritual, like otherworldly force that comes together and hears you say that and then puts you in that situation. Hmm. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Which I'll, I don't I'll say this. I visualized kicking that field goal before I went out. I fucked that up. Yeah. That's not so. how my visualization went at all. Did oh. you ever visualize missing it though? Like, did you have some thoughts? Oh fuck, I might miss this. I did think about that, yeah. So maybe yeah. I manifested the miss. But yeah. I, I sat down and I closed my eyes and I, I visualized the kick going through. Okay. Over and over again. It didn't work. Negative thinking I think can hurt more than positive thinking can help. You might be right about that. I think that's true. true. Um, but yeah, Mince, do you think you have uh, manifested your current position in life? A little bit. I think the biggest thing that uh, people need to figure out about the human experience is it's just we all are evolving and changing all the time. And you can be a different person than you were three years ago, five years ago, ten years ago, because, I mean, Aaron kind of just said it, stuff's going to happen in life. You know, that's just part, like, that's just part of it. And it's how you react. And if you're resilient and if you 
keep a good attitude about it. And uh, you just try to evolve as a person. So I'm a lot different at 40 than I was at 35 or 30. And that's what you're supposed to be. And I've always thought that that's what's weird about marriage is you're supposed to evolve so much as a human. And like allegedly in marriage, you're supposed to do it together. But I don't know that that's how it works. Like I feel like people are always evolving and changing. And so like people get married at like 23, you look up at 39, you're completely different people. And so I I just, Mm -hmm. I feel like the human experience is about changing and being open-minded and a big part of that is like I noticed, and we'll get to this in the story, but the two ruts I was in in life were when I needed to move and change it up. Like a lot of times people get stuck in their, you know, their eight to five grind every day where they do the same stuff over and over. And you kind of just go through the motions and you miss the real human experience, like evolving and changing. Mm-hmm. He just said, uh, you wasted your time getting married this summer, Donnie. I didn't say- <laughs> no, but I, I always have thought that though, a little bit, that it's like different. Dude, yeah, I hope well. We'll see in five years if, <laughs> if we're evolving together or evolving. That's my excuse for not getting drugs. married. At least. You know, it's not, yeah. It has nothing to do with yeah, that I hadn't yeah. picked up the right one yet. No, I do think that's true. I mean, I've said it a lot of time on this podcast that, you know, marriage marriage has been marketed to us. And originally it was uh, a form of keeping women of property. And so over the years, it's kind of turned into like this marketing campaign. Like you got to get her a diamond and the, you know, 2.5 kids and white picket fence. And so like we feel very strongly about love and we attribute that to the bondage of marriage. And it's a, it's a hard thing to, to, to deal with. And I think why the divorce rates are so high is because people are now realizing like, and also people are not getting married at the same rate as they were either. I think people are starting to realize like, it's kind of not for everybody. Like if you, that's your thing, that's your thing, but it's a very difficult thing to do to grow at 20 years old and be and grow with somebody that long a period of time. It's very hard to do in a realistic stance where you're staying true and honorable to each other. It's very, and yourselves, honestly, more than anything, it's, it's a tough thing to, to accomplish, but Hey, good on you. I'm not against it. Just saying it's very hard to do. Low, low key, that divorce stat, that 60% of marriages end in divorce is overinflated by people who get married multiple times and get multiple divorces. Well, I got why, nothing why but respect it? for people that got that get married like four times and get divorced four times. That Sometimes yeah. after oh. only like six months. Yeah. Yeah. Like Larry well, King. Could, How many wives did Larry King have? I think he had nine or seven. Yeah. Was he like Henry VIII? There should be a max. You get <laughs> That's not very libertarian, Big T. Also, it's like <laughs> you get three. No, he's talking about in the eyes of the Lord. You, uh, I, if you get divorced a third time, you're done. I also don't see he who's going to stop you. Big life. Who's going to stop King? that? Is that you? Can, I mean, clearly you know. nobody. But <laughs> in my in my view, nobody should get married four times. And the thing is, you agree man? with that? If you've already had I don't, two do divorces, you, feel, you can. I don't be think people should get married at all. But if you want to get married four times, hey, brother, dude, it's your it's your business. It sounds complicated to me. Okay, it's so very competitive. The, I don't know what you're trying to accomplish. The real, <laughs> the real statistic is around of first time marriages, forty percent end in separation or divorce. But why, Within, why, why discount people that get married twice? Why, why, why is that? Why is that variable important? Well, because I think it shows a, a like if someone's racking up the divorce rate, like to that's just different to, just than, to skew the stats. Larry, yeah, it's <laughs> skewing the stats. <laughs> And that's 43% of marriages end in separation or divorce within 15 years. But why? But I'm saying, explain to me why somebody who gets married again doesn't count. That is, why are we discounting those? As I, marriages? Because, because it skews the stats because that person's putting up more divorces. Uh, than okay, do you have anything? Thing, other someone than who's that, married that once. No but that don't make no well, sense, though. Billy's saying if that you're, it's the, the type of person that would get divorced one time would be more likely to get divorced a second time and a third yes. time. That may be true, but why are we discounting that as a marriage? It's still a marriage. Because because it it, it uh that whole sixty percent of marriages end in divorce stat it, like scares people off from ever getting married the first time. Yeah, I I've yet I feel like you're not hearing what I'm saying. I'm saying why, why are we discounting count? the people that are they're still getting married? Because a lot of people get married with the goal of being together forever, uh, till death do you part. And that's uh sort of the goal. Like that's what why a lot of people get married is for lifetime partnership. And 
a lot of people do hit that goal, but people who don't like, that's why people sort of, that's the ideal situation in their mind. When people get married, no one gets married being like, Oh, I'm going to get divorced in the next, you know, 10 years. Agree. So, I mean, but you, I don't, I don't understand why we discount the people. Cause it's still, it's still the human experience. If we're, like that's part of the their human experience is getting married and then feeling like okay that didn't work out but this this is going to work out and it doesn't work out it's just part of the it is what it is billy's just he's otherizing people that have gotten divorced that's, that's what it's no, about, I'm right? no, no i'm not no i'm not at all like i'm not at all i'm saying <laughs> first time marriage divorce first time marriage divorce rates are a lot uh lower than the overall divorce rate but big t i, I know what you're saying when you say like that you should be allowed three marriages, but it kind of rocks when you're on like your seventh. This, sure. It makes no sense though. Like I feel like after your second marriage, if you meet someone else and you guys are in a loving relationship, why even get married? You guys can just be in a long-term relationship. Yeah. That's, and if your wife number seven, you know that like, okay, that, this isn't going to work, but let's have fun for a couple of years as a husband and wife. <laughs> like we're basically at that point, you're getting married just so you can have a big ass party. And to have legal claim to assets that there's a good track record you will receive half of if you do this. <laughs> yeah. And you're you're <laughs> angling for admission to the ex-wife group chat because I guarantee once you get mm. like three divorces, then the three ex-wives they have, they've got a text. Yeah, it's a, it's a sisterhood. Yeah. It's a sorority of <laughs> ex-wives. Well, yeah. it might not because then what if like you cheated on one of the Jones with the new Jones, you know what I mean? Then it's like, well, a lot, it could be a lot of bitterness. You there could know. be, but think about it in, let's say, so let's say wife, or let's say husband cheats on wife one with wife two. Yeah. Then wife two and husband get married. Then wife, wait, then husband cheats on wife two with wife three. Yep. Then wife you, two and wife one are against wife three. Then, okay. yeah. No, I think, I think what happens at that point is wife two goes to wife one and says, Hey, I acted really dumb when I was younger, and now that I've gone through this experience, I understand what you went through. I'm sorry. I hope you can forgive me. Yeah. And like, let's let's make the best of this, and maybe we can be friends at some point. And then, um, wife one, if she is like a, a forgiving person, would say like, "Listen, I I knew this was going to happen. I'm I'm glad that you see my side. Once of it. a cheater, always a cheater. And then they root for wife three to get cheated on. Yeah. And then they can admit wife three in after she makes the I'm sorry speech to them. Right. Yeah. It's a it's um accepting defeat, and then you have to yeah you have to be like initiated into the group. Yeah, and they just hate the current wife. You lose them how you got them. The yeah, you lose them how you got them. I lose them how you got them. Yeah, I think at that point right. it's like. What like do I'm we have? At a library. I'm a loser at the library. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you, have, you loser to books. <laughs> but like, yeah, you you can't. Um, once once you're on wife number three, wife one and wife two have nothing to gain by not being friends. Apparently, Robin Williams was like broke when he committed suicide because he had had like three wives, and each time he got divorced, they took half his wealth. And so it just kept that like his wealth kept on getting halved and halved and halved. And like yeah. he's one of the like the the greatest actors of all time. And when he died, I guess he was in debt. Like, like damn. And the, just he was like having to take these TV I'm show jobs where like that shit on shows he didn't even want to work for. He just needed the it paycheck. Infuriates me. Like some random chick is getting residuals from his doubtfire dog. It's fucking crazy, dog. It's <laughs> yeah. insane, dog. It's insane. It's not God. unlike a coach buyout. <laughs> like A and M paying multiple coaches to not work there anymore. That that be my thing, dog. Is like, unless you like, there, there are some, I guess, tax purposes for like the regular couple who you know have modest jobs, and there's nothing wrong with that. But but for niggas who got bread, that just makes no sense to put that shit on paper, dog. What does the government got to do with your relationship? It makes no sense to me. Uh, there's some benefits I, that go along with it, like in the event of death getting something transferred to next to Ken end of life decisions. If like somebody gets into a car accident and you don't know that, what the other person wants, that could all be written out. They could all, that could all be discussed, well, handed over. Well, you're just arguing for a prenup Arian. Yes. Yeah. So Are the only thing prenup. I can advocate for is a, is a pre pup. Uh, a lot of like young couples get a, get a dog together 
And uh, fellas, if you love that dog, make sure you get a pre-pup, which is just like I get the dog if we break up because I, I've been seeing a lot of my my friends who uh, raise dogs with their girlfriends and break up and it, it kills them. That would be tough, yeah. Lose another fellas, dog. get a pre-pup. Just buy the dog yourself. I mean, courts are always like give the house to the woman, give the car to the woman. They should always lean to give the dog to the guy. Yeah. Let that be the one thing that we have. <laughs> you get the you get no money, no house, but you get the dog. You get the dog you're yeah. living. <laughs> that that's pretty sweet. A lot of dudes. Pre-pup. That's all they need. Hello. We want pre-pup. We want pre-pup. <laughs> um we want pre-pup. the craziest story is uh J. Howard Marshall uh and uh Anna Anna Nicole Smith. You know that story? Yeah. She she married an 89 year old and thought that she was gonna get like millions and millions of dollars. And uh, then she got nothing. She was a playmate. And he died. She was a playmate. Yeah. Didn't he die like a couple months after they got married? Yeah. And then she tried to claim everything. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Respect. Um, all right. Let's let's get more into the Mincy experience here. Um, let's do it. Mince. Can we talk about the origins? Yes. Tell us. So, so you're talking about growing up in Monroe, Louisiana. Yes. I uh, grew up in Monroe. I was there till I was 18. What were you like as a kid? I was always uh, had the big glasses. Always had the big glasses. I actually got LASIK surgery the week before I got hired by Barstool. I always had like, I was kind of the fat kid with glasses, you know. Mm-hmm. But I was always uh, what you see is what you get. I was super high energy. Always have been. Did you have a lot of friends? Uh, yeah, I did. I was like freshman class for eight favorite in high school. I always got along with people. Um, just super hard on my sleeve. I've always been that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, did that ever get you in trouble growing up? I mean, I feel like I've been trying to defuse situations my entire life because of it. But, uh, you know, I just have always been myself, though. I've always tried to be true to myself with it. And I just – my dad – I got all this from my dad. My dad has more energy than me. Uh, he's – like, when I'm out to dinner with him, I barely even talk. He's so intense. You'll love meeting him one day. He's, he's ridiculous. He's I would un- like to meet him. He's unbelievable. But uh, So I'm did just, you – so having a dad that, that was that outgoing and you being who you are, also very outgoing, did you ever feel like you had to, like, compete – with your dad like uh i never really i I wouldn't really go that far i just always like laugh because it was funny for me because everybody thinks i'm so ridiculous and he's on a level that makes me feel normal with it Uh so i always just kind of enjoyed it all right so so you had some friends growing up did you play sports when you were in high school yeah so uh i figured out when i was young you know i played you know baseball that for fun i I figured out when i was about 12 or 13 like i could be the fat kid in right field or I could make the best of it, and I went all in on tennis like a solid private school kid. And uh, I actually got – you know, I was always like probably 20 pounds overweight, but I was number 25 in Louisiana when I was 16, and we won a state championship um, my senior year of high school. And I want to share that story real quick because this is one of the best I've got. Uh, my senior year, at the sports banquet my junior year, I, I got up and guaranteed a state championship like Joe Namath style. Yeah. And everybody's just like, who the hell is this kid who cares about tennis? But I got up and like made a whole production of it because we'd gotten like third. And then state quarterfinals, my partner and I are playing the number two seeds in Baton Rouge, and we're huge underdogs. I mean, we're supposed to get smoked. And I don't know if like God came down in my body or Andre Agassi or something. We're <laughs> losing two. we're losing three two <laughs> first set, and then we just beat the hell out of them. We beat them six three, six up. And the funniest part of it was my partner's like this Italian dude with kind of like darker skin. And I'm like a big dude just rallying this top five guy off the baseline. And in the second set, the guy we're playing, Mark Chapitaw, throws his racket and said, how the hell are we losing to a fat guy and a Mexican in the match? <laughs> yeah, and then we won state by one point because of that match. And then I wish I could find a, a tape of this because I got up the sports banquet like right after we won state. And I'm just like, y'all got to call me Broadway Ben Mintz because just like the great Joe Namath, I walked the walk and talked the talk about guaranteeing the title. So we gotta, so that was my athletic highlight. We gotta That's get, all I got. We got to get you on a tennis court again, Mincy. I'm still pretty good, I think. I'm moving really well right now. Yeah, I want to see you play tennis. I want to go, go to play with Jake. Pong. I mean, uh, Jake would probably work me, but I'd like to go out there and play with Jake. Mm-hmm. I, th- I think that would be fun. Um, I, I don't think Jake was ever the 25th ranked tennis player in his state. Oh, I bet he was. I would be shocked if he wasn't. I don't know, man. So so you played tennis in high school. He, now you've got a brain that is uh, it's unique, but it's also really into numbers. Yeah, so I was, I was actually numbers. a statistician for football and basketball for the high school team, so I always did that. Uh, I kind of have a photographic memory where I'll like see a phone number and I'll just remember it if I see it once, and that was a big part of why I was good at poker because, you know, with all the numbers and mental math, mm-hmm. they've always been a huge strength of mine. 
And so online poker, especially, you're just making educated guesses, calculating odds and all that kind of stuff. And so my brain uh, was super wired to that and I uh, ended up doing pretty, you know, did, did pretty well with poker. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to do a little test on you. Okay, Mince. Okay. So you said that you can see a phone number and you can remember it just by looking at it, right? I'm not going to tell you anything about this. I want you to look at that number. I'm going to okay. give you five seconds. Oh, wait, he shouldn't, he shouldn't say it out loud though. Cause no, don't say it out loud. Okay. <laughs> don't say it out loud. Okay. But here, we'll let you take a look at it. Yeah, I got See it. See it? Yep. All right. Now we're going to go back to it in just like a couple minutes. Okay. So, um, so growing up, you're a statistician, uh, you're in, in high school playing tennis, and then you got to figure out what we're going to do for college. How were your grades in high school? Uh, pretty good. I think I had like a 3-5. Uh, you know, I, I, I was pretty uh, pretty good student. I feel like I, I was my, – my peers have all done really well. I mean, one's like a huge lawyer for hedge fund. Uh, one's an oil and gas attorney in Texas. You know, my, my friend group, a bunch of them have all been extremely successful, and so I think that helped me because we all pushed each other. Yeah, so um, what was that number that I gave you? Uh, it was. Can I say the number out loud? Yeah, say it out loud. Okay. You went back too quick. He knows that number. That's Billy's number. Is it? I, I don't know. I, <laughs> That's Billy's number. But uh, no, no, I definitely let, need let's make sure we put that out yeah. Yeah. when we put it out. <laughs> well, this is, you do have an opportunity to do something very funny right now. Doc's Billy. Uh, I do. Good Dude, point. You, Good point, Big payback, T. Payback, payback. Mine was He's, an accident. Billy's been through a lot recently. Um, also, can we Oh yeah, I forgot. can we he put something you. over Mincy's face when he says that so they can't read his lips? Yes. Yeah. Because there that will be, be somebody that we that will can blur. try. Look what I'm <laughs> doing. You. For I you, appreciate Billy. it. I'm really going out on a limb. <laughs> All right. So so going up through uh through high school, you uh you gotta figure that you're looking towards your future, where you're gonna go to school. We're getting into some Act One stuff here. Okay. Um, where did you dabble in any extracurricular activities? In or, high school. In yeah. high school, I started drinking probably my sophomore year when I was like sixteen. Mm -hmm. You know, I started drinking then, but that was it. Uh, in high school, uh, the college thing was a real interesting debate because my dad went to LSU, and I'm from Monroe, but then my mom's side, which is my old Miss side, our family has a farm in the Mississippi Delta, like Lake Washington, kind of like twenty miles from Greenville, and so. My mom was diehard Ole Miss and my dad was LSU and I couldn't figure out where I wanted to go to school. Like usually in uh, high school, you commit in April to where you're going to go to college. Mm -hmm. I didn't decide until late June and listen to this move my mom pulls to make me go to Ole Miss. She left the Robert Frost poem, uh, the road not taken on my pillow to try to convince me to go to Ole Miss yeah. to do something different from Louisiana and obviously ended up doing it. Uh, no regrets. Took a long and really long and winding road in Oxford. But was it, was your dad upset that you went to Ole Miss? No, my dad was super laid back about it. He's just like, I just want you to be happy, son. You know, he's what, not, what did he do? He was a financial consultant. Okay. Um, he was a banker for a while, and he started his own financial consultant practice, uh, sold it, retired, doing great. Was, it, was he a diehard football fan? Uh, he, he's like a sports fan, but he wasn't like live or die with it, but he always enjoyed you know, watching it. And he took me to – you know, we went to Cubs games and Rangers games, and you know, we it was always a part, part of my life for sure. But he was always – you know, he supports it still, but he doesn't live and die with it mm -hmm. so you go to Ole Miss were you in a fraternity at Ole yes Miss? I was an ATO uh pledged my freshman year and it was weird so the Ole Miss thing is such a long experience for me I joke all the time I went in with Eli Manning and I graduated with Chad Kelly okay okay and so it was like three different college experiences you had the first one where it was like the standard one where you live in the dorm freshman year and then I lived in the frat house two years you kind of have the usual you know experience and then I was kind of like I didn't know what I wanted to do. I was a finance major, but I like was half assed in school. And I started playing poker, five dollar games in the ATO house when the Chris Moneymaker 03 World Series mm -hmm. happened when the big poker boom happened. And I've got, and this is a fun thing to talk about microdosing, because everybody has different personalities. I've got a just an addiction based personality. And like a lot of people can do like moderation and be balanced. I'm all in on stuff or I'm nothing. And I got super obsessed with poker where I was like reading books and started playing, going up to Tunica, Mississippi, which is an hour north, playing low stakes games, you know, playing $5 sit and goes online. And then everything changed in April of 2006 when I'm like 22 and I'm playing a $22 tournament on party poker. And I probably have 300 bucks in my name, broke college kid. And there's 2,400 people in this thing. And I just win the thing, 10,000. Mm -hmm. And at that time when I'm 22 and you're a college kid, I thought I was a millionaire. It's a lot of money. Yeah, and I decided right then. I was like, oh, well, we got to see where this goes. What would you do with the money? What's the first thing you bought? 
I took all the boys to Como Steakhouse the next night for celebration dinner. Love we had like it. eight or ten of us. Uh, and I remember I called my mom the next day. My mom was uh, an attorney, uh, head, head attorney for the main hospital in Monroe, and you know certainly didn't want her baby boy to be a pro gambler. And I remember I was telling her the story of one of that poker tournament. She was like, oh, no. Cause she She's knew. like, she knew where this she was. Knew. She knew. She knew where this was heading. And then I kept kind of like – half ass into like taking three or six hours of school, but really just playing poker all the way into like 07 and 08 uh, when I went to college in 01. And finally I was like, man, I'm making a lot of money through poker. I mean, I was doing really well. And uh, I knew I always wanted to move to New Orleans. Wait, and, so you went, you went to Ole Miss in 2001? Yeah, and, and I hung old? around Oxford till like 08, but I was like the really 06, 07, 08, I was just playing poker. Like, Were you still like hanging out with the, the kids that were in the frat? So – because I, I can just see Mincy as like the living local legend that's been in, at school for, for eight years. And he's going to play poker, but he's going to come over on Saturday night, chop it up with the boys. Yeah, some of that. It was almost more like I had friends that were uh, some a couple Monroe guys or two of my best friends that were three years younger that played poker with me. And so I basically hung around with all their friends. <laughs> uh-huh. So the second journey was like me with this whole crew that's three or four years younger than me that I'm super close with. Uh, still to this day, I actually saw all of them in Athens, Georgia, at Ole Miss, Georgia, uh, a couple weeks ago. But I was doing real well with the poker, and then I could tell this is what I talked about the life rut thing. So it was like oh eight, and I'm like, damn, dude, I've been in Oxford seven or eight years. I don't have a degree. Like were I got. You, were I, you drinking a lot then? Yeah, a good bit. But yeah. like more, I was just like I kind of got into. I was blazing a little bit too, mm-hmm, and nice. with the poker, the 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 weed, the blazing was a big thing with like online poker. You just sit there and get blazed and jam out and play. Uh, poker so i got real into that and the biggest thing and i know pft and i share a love for new orleans i've been talking for years like okay i need to move to new orleans i need to move to new orleans and i finally do it in 09 which nice year because the saint super bowl mm-hmm. and i moved down there i got to go to like eight games went to the nfc championship and how was the dome rock dude back then? that was the most emotional the, the, the nfc championship was the most emotional sporting event i've ever seen yeah. i mean just everybody crying after the katrina coming back and uh so right after the NFC Championship, I, I was playing World Series of Poker Tunica, and I wasn't planning on going to the Super Bowl, and I get fifth in a $500 tournament for like 7 k on the Thursday. And I was just like, whatever, a lot of money's going to come and go. Just snap, booked the flight to Miami, bought a ticket, got a $1,200 ticket, which you couldn't do in this day and age. It was like front row, upper deck, and then I was there for the Saints beating the Colts, the ambush, onside kick, so I got to go to the Super Bowl. And then right out of that Super Bowl, my buddy, who I'm still good friends with, who's one of the best poker players in the world, Michael Rocco, comes back to New Orleans with me, and he's like, I'm going to work on my poker, your poker game with you. And he starts tutoring me, and I go on the biggest damn poker heater I've ever seen. I mean, I probably had like four or five K to my name in January, and I got it up to like – I was doing really well. I got it up to like 30 or 40 K in mid-April, and then this week happens in late April 2010 where I'm playing a $216 tournament on full tilt, 2,400 people. Make a deal one on one with the guy, hit it for seventy six thousand. And like, what does that mean? Uh, like a lot of times, so I'm playing a guy. I was Matt Isles, a guy named uh, I pay your rent online. We get heads up. We had near the same stack, and we were friends. And the money difference was like forty k. So we made a deal where we split the money and just played for like five k. Okay. So I hit this seventy six k. It's Jazz Fest. Pearl Jam was the headliner. Uh, big widespread panic fan. They were Thursday. So I like go eat a celebration deal at Clan- a meal at Clancy's, one of my favorite uptown restaurants do pearl jam and panic then come back sunday and hit another online poker tournament for fifteen thousand. Won one ninety grand in a week during you, you during felt, jazz fest you felt like the smartest person in the world at that point yeah right? you, but you also young and stupid i mean i'm like 26 at the time and you don't realize like how lucky i got for that to happen and uh, all of a sudden i have like a big six-figure bankroll i'm in new orleans and uh i got more money than since at that point i would say and uh, what do they say? Like the idle hands of the devil's playground. Like don't don't give someone like me a lot of money when I'm in my <laughs> mid twenties in New Orleans, you know. And uh, I did really well in 2010, and then 2011, I was I cr- I got it up to where I was like top 200 in the world in online tournaments. I mean, I wasn't like one of the best, but I was really good, making a solid living. And then the day that changed everything was what's called Black Friday in the poker world. It was April 15th of 2011 tax day mm-hmm. you log on to the sites and it's just the doj logo that says this site has been seized yeah and the department of justice just shuts down full tilt and poker stars that's such a hilarious flex that they do whenever they take a website it's like they're they're, they're showing this is our property it's like yeah put up the logo 
Yeah. This is ours, bitch. So it was, so like, I was like, wow, I just like got to top 200 and now my career is uh, kind of being taken from me. And so, you know, naturally I'm like, okay, I'm just going to play live poker. And I'd play a lot at Harris, New Orleans and Beau Rivage, Biloxi. And then I go on this, 2011 was uh, one of my favorite years. I was uh, running a lot then, had a lot of money. And uh, I actually got 75th in the World Series main event that summer for 90K. Uh, that was my best live poker poker thing ever. I mean, I made day six. Uh, it, I mean, there were 7,000 people in it. That's the big one. And then right out of that, I got third in a Jacksonville tournament for 53K. And then I got 12th in an Oklahoma one for 35K back to back to back. And I'm like, Psh, I'm Phil Ivey, bitches. You know, I'm just like, <laughs> it doesn't matter. There's no online poker. I could just travel around and pick up 40K scores all the time. Yeah. So what's the tax situation like on that? I mean, I paid them, paid a lot of them. Uh, but you get to write off your, uh, you keep all your seats where you lose and you can write off all your losses and expenses and stuff. But so basically, I thought I was like, way better than I was. And uh, I felt like I was kind of living like an honorage a little bit. Like I just like book a flight. Like, mm -hmm. oh, I'm going to book a $600 flight to go play the World Poker Tour at AC the next day. And... Uh, Were you blazing then? Yeah. Yeah, I was a little bit. And uh, I was also... once I had when, that you say, when you say blazing a little just, bit, like how, how frequently are we talking? Here? Pretty good bit. Pretty uh, every day. Yeah. You know, definitely. That, I'd, I'd it, always play... I always did when I was playing poker. Did it help you, like, concentrate more? Yeah, I loved... I mean, I always just loved getting some speaker. I'd have, like, two 24-inch monitors. So, we had the basement of my apartment. We called it... My online poker name was The Destroyer. And we called the basement The Destroyer Dome. And we had a stretch in the basement where I was part of it. But there were three other people that were really good. We're, like, in, like, a two-month span. We won, like, 400K in this, this, ba was, in this basement. What was The Destroyer Dome like? How was it outfitted? Okay, it was like a... The left side of like a huge couch, big screen TV. I have two 24 inch monitors. So I used to play like eight games at once because I've got that photographic memory where you're just making quick decisions as fast as you can. So I'd have four games up on each 24 inch monitor and uh, just, and I would just jam. I mean, we just throw music on, whatever, and uh, rock out and play. I loved it. It was so much fun. Uh, those were definitely the, the, the glory days. We were in like the warehouse district in NOLA. Pretty close to Harris, kind of at the convention center. Yeah. You, you talked about your love for widespread panic. There, I was always raging the shows when I played, yeah. And I know I, you uh, you invited me to my first widespread panic show. We had a big show. time. It was a, it was a big time. Big time. Big and you know, your photographic memory is also whatever the year equivalent of that is. Yeah, 2011, I the year I'm talking about, had my best poker year. got the 75th in the main, all that. I went to 32 panic shows that year, too. That's crazy. Yeah, so one you know year. how many you've been to total? I'm around 200. I'm near it. Wow. And Mincy was, he, he was sitting next to me at the show and within about, I'd say a quarter second, half second tops, once they started to meld into a different song, Mince knows exactly what oh, song yeah. it is right off the bat. Oh yeah. It was very impressive. I would like, so one of my favorite things, and this is what I do at Barstool too. It's like a strategy thing. My favorite thing to do is just get these calendars out and figure out where, you, where like two or three badass things are together. And so what I was doing in 2011 was I'd like look at the panic tour and find out where poker events were bought. And I just like go on poker trips and go to shows. You're doing Venn diagrams yeah. of just cool live events. That was the, the beginnings of what's now Mincy tour here at Barstool. Like so figuring that, out the calendar. Events mints, baby. So when, <laughs> Widespread poker, baby. When, when, WSP when, squared. Yeah. Or WSOP squared. When did the Mincy tour start? 2011? Really? Yeah. 2011. I mean, it got, it got so wild in 2011. I ended up at Ames, Iowa one night at a show. I mean, like I, you know, this thing just got completely out of what control. Is it, what is it about panic that, that, made you obsessed with them because i can it's tell the energy so i locked a, in on them no so it was like 2006 first show i went to was a mid-south coliseum in memphis and they like actually tore the building down after it but there was an energy at that show that gripped me and like it's kind of like a high energy sporting event like lsu's got it at death valley or superdome when you're at like a big event where the energy level is just so high you feel like it just grips you and you just feel like you're just like part of something and it, they got me with the hook uh on a Rod Me High, J.J. Kale cover that night. It just, I was like, man, I want to be part of this. So have you been chasing that the entire time? You've been following Panic Round? Or, or does it ever get back up to that level? It, it gets back up to that level a decent bit. But, like, it's almost like a religion thing to me now. Because, like, you see, like, as I lose, like, I run. What I figured out is, like, a trick with running where I just run to these shows. And all I do, instead of dancing at a concert, I'm running. So I'm just jamming out these shows and like these songs are like 10, 12 minute jams. I'm like, oh, I'm going to listen to five songs and run five miles. Yeah. And so it's a trick. And I feel like I've like beat the running thing 
because like running seven miles, I'm just like, oh, I'm just like going back to some concert I went to and just running. Yeah. What, one thing I love about you, Mincy, is is the uh, the obsession that you get with things and how. That's you, what I was just talking you, about. The yeah. addictive personality. You find something and you're like, I'm going to know everything there is about this. This is. It could be very good or very brain. bad. It could be yeah. There's two and sides it's been both. Arian, I'm curious to know from your perspective. Um, do you have do you go through a pattern where you get really into stuff and then you move on to the next thing? Or do you have like any current obsessions that you're dealing with? Uh golf. I'm pretty yeah. obsessed with golf, but I think that's more of like a um it soothes a lot of a lot of uh I guess needs that I need right now. I need peace. I need to stay active. I need uh, to like get away from electronics, and it like does all those things very seamlessly. And I, I need to be challenged, so that does all that those things mm-hmm. very seamlessly. But um, <clears throat> yeah, I guess I guess it's kind of human nature. I guess you just get interested in something, and you pick it up, and you drop it. Um, never to the extent that it like changes the course of my life. <laughs> I guess, mm-hmm. but uh, well, I guess you could say my. I guess you f- football. That was more. You, of, you I don't know. You definitely had to be obsessed with, with honing your craft at some point. Yeah, you do. Um, but or was to it more me, about the, the ultimate goal of like what that is going to bring you? Yeah, to me, the ends always justified to me. So it's like I, it's not that I was like super obsessed with football, but I was obsessed with getting better so that at the end, you know, I got what the end result would be. So I guess in a sense, you could say yeah. So I became obsessed with like the the end goal. What about when you talk about um, like your love of physics, like getting into the whole Newtonian time space continuum shit? At some point, I feel like you have to be obsessed with that to learn about it to the extent that you have. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've read a lot of books on it, a lot of papers. Um, uh, I think that obsession comes from more of an innate curiosity I have for life. It's not necessarily a um like i guess it, it just it just blended very well with like who i was as a human being like when i was a kid i always looked up at the stars and i was like what the fuck are we doing here like what is all this and like then i majored in philosophy that kind of helped accumulate the thoughts around it and put a you know a package on okay this is a way to think you know mm-hmm. like these existential thoughts i'm having and then physics the physics that you learn about like astrophysics it kind of gives you an explanation that kind of soothes the curiosity yeah but the way my mind works is always analytical but yeah you have to become obsessed with it as far as like what are we doing like this it's why i can't fall asleep with just darkness like in pitch black i have to fall asleep with some kind of like ambient noise or tv or something like that because if i just sit up my mind will race and there's no way I'll go to sleep. Yeah. Um, Big T, when did you realize that you loved Tennessee football? Because it sounds like you are to Tennessee football what Mincy is to widespread panic. I mean, <clears throat> when I went to school. Yeah, you remember the first time you went to Neyland Stadium? Yep, Oklahoma 2015. Did it blow your mind? Uh, I mean, I'd gone to a ton of college football games before. That one was different, though. That was an insane... Like one of the loudest environments. Wait, I've Mitch ever remembers that game. What was your experience like at that game? Mitch? I wasn't at the game, but I, rem- I just remember how hyped up it was, and I remember that was Mayfield, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was yeah, Baker's. They, yeah, they got uh, they got y'all at the end. Yeah, we were up seventeen nothing and lost in double overtime. Yeah, I remember right? that. Mitch remembers it. Was that like holy shit? I love this. I can't wait to do this for the rest of my life. Did you know? Yeah, I guess. Did the energy in there kind of get you on the same thing I'm talking about with like a greater energy level? Like just just being there kind of hook you a little bit? Did it make you believe in God? I believed in God long prior to okay. that. Uh, yeah, it was awesome. I, I, I love college football. I love Tennessee. You know, I mm-hmm. don't know. Mincy's on a different like plane, though, when it comes to stuff like Mincy's, you know, whole thing is just different developing an obsession with something so uh mincy what did you have like a plan you started winning these poker tournaments you're doing pretty well for yourself did you have like a long-term vision or were you just flying by the seat of your pants so okay this is there's a thing that's really interesting in life and i'm really curious to hear what y'all say about this and you've done a good job with your career not falling to this there's a thing that gets a lot of people called winner's tilt and that's when you like set some kind of goal 
and you get there and you get complacent. Mm -hmm. And like my goal in poker was like, I can't wait to see what life's like when I get a hundred K bankroll. That was, that was it. I was like, if I get to a hundred K, that was the number. And then I got there and I just took my foot off the gas completely. Like I didn't think like, Hey, I got a hundred, let's go get a million. It was like, Oh, I have a hundred K now I can play 10 hours a week instead of 40 and just travel and go to shows and go out and party and just do whatever I want. And there's a thing in life where you see this, no matter what you're in business at sports, poker, golf's like this too. If you're not still hungry, there's young people that are, that are coming for your ass. And, you know, I think, like I said, you've done a good job in your career with, you know, not getting complacent and just always, you know, working hard and continuing to build. But I got lazy with it when I got that money. Yeah. And, you know, in 2012 and 13, you know, I thought that poker heater I was on would last forever and it definitely didn't. And I didn't adjust my lifestyle at all. I'm still traveling, seeing panic and partying in new Orleans. Did the doing, game pass you by? Uh, it, it, it kind of, I mean, I still thought I was like good in the South stuff. I'm still like a favorite, but yeah, I mean, there are, I'm not near like, I would, yeah, kind of, I would say, I wouldn't say I'm like totally washed up, but it definitely caught up to me, but really caught away up to me. It was just the off field behavior yeah. uh, mm-hmm. that gets a lot of people. And then like, I actually went so I, I, this is a funny thing. I lived in Mexico for six months in 2013 playing online poker. That was uh, interesting. I was in Rosarito Beach, kind of by Tijuana. Yeah, there are all these expats that move there to play online poker for after I got outlawed, and that seemed like a good idea at the time. But then I was like, "What the hell am I doing? Like, I'm away from all my friends and family, like playing internet poker. Kind of didn't go the best. Go back to New Orleans, and in early 2014. All my money had kind of started drying up. I remember, I, like you know, my bankroll was down to like three or five thousand dollars. And I remember, I got a phone call that kind of changed uh, the trajectory of my life from one of my best friends, uh, Elliot Willard in Oxford. And he was like, "Dude, you've been saying forever you want to go back and finish school. Like you're not doing well right now. Like you're obviously like partying too hard, and your poker roll's drying up." And he's like, uh, "I got a house." like a block from the square in Oxford. I'm finishing too. I got a second bedroom for you. Just get your ass up here and let's figure this out. So I knew when I committed to that, I'm like, okay, we're sending this out in style. And Jazz Fest 2014, I just went nuts for two weeks. <laughs> went to everything, you know, all the, it was like Clapton, Carlos Santana, a ton of people went to like the festival every day, went to every night show till 5 a.m. Cause I knew that was the end. And Donnie always laughs about this when I tell the story, but like, I felt like I was crawling back up to Mississippi up I-55 in the fetal position when I went back to Oxford. Yeah. Yeah. I was just like a broken, beaten man. And, uh, you like overdid it so much that yeah, I'm, re- yeah. I'm ready to clean things yeah, up. Yeah. Yeah. And I knew. What was, it, what was a typical day like for you at Jazz Fest? If you, you wake up in the morning, I just get out. I'd usually get out there at like two or 3 p.m. because the stuff I love are the night shows, man. The Jazz Fest, you'll have like the 10 p.m. shows at bars and then you got like the 2 a.m. shows. Yeah. And the diehards come out that, at 2 to 5 a.m. Those shows are, uh, pretty wild. Yeah. And, were you dumping sack back then? Uh, yeah, you know, I got to, I got to, you know, I was definitely being a little liberal with my, I was having a big time. We'll put it that way. Probably uh-huh. a little more. And definitely was probably spending more money than I should and probably killing a few brain cells. And uh, it was interesting that the going back to school, I'm like 31 years old and I go from being 75th in the World Series main and like, you know, I wasn't like a big shot in the poker world, but I was established. People knew, people knew the Destroyer was everywhere I went. Yeah. And I go back to to school and I go from being like something built up in my own head, you know, whatever. People don't really care that much about poker other than the main. But in my mind, I was something, you know, when you're like late 20s. And I go back to college and I mean, I'm just like a broke, at 31, I'm a broke college kid. I take a job at Proud Larry's making salads and pizza for like eight an hour while I'm finishing school. And I was like embarrassed to tell people I was doing it because like how where I was in the poker world, it was like an ego hit. But that was the best thing that ever happened to me. Because I came out of that gambling world where I was so desensitized to money and just everything that going back to college and finishing my finance degree, I graduated with a 2.00000. And I think I was at Ole Miss, you know, like I said, in uh, May 2015, started with Eli in 01, yeah. finished at 15. But it was more about like, you know, going to work on time and having a job and hitting the re- the recenter button. And I'll always, uh, you know, that was one of the best decisions I've ever made. Not even for the, deg- the degree part. You know, I'm, I'm proud I got a degree. Good. Yeah. Whatever. That matters or it doesn't. But it was more about just recentering in life because I was so fried coming out of the game. What world. was your health like at that point? All right. So I got really into the running in like 11 and 12 and dropped a ton of weight. But then I just gradually started gaining it back. And at 14 or 15, I was like – 
Like right now, I think I'm like mid two thirties. I think I was like two sixty, two sixty five. It then. seems to me the lifestyle of, of playing poker, video poker, would not lend itself to being in great shape. Well, all the, time. the thing about it is, all you care about is money, and so you get into this like super selfish thing where you're like, oh, when I have a hundred k or I hit two hundred k, I'm going to be happy. But you're not focusing on like living a healthy, balanced lifestyle and your friends and your family and all the stuff you realize that's really important in life for like your experiences and relationships. It's not. There's more to life than just your bank account, even though, you know, I think Kanye said it best. It's like, what careful, <laughs> <laughs> fair, fair, fair. But he said it, it was like having money isn't everything, but not having it is. And yeah. it's like, when you don't have it, it's all you can think about. But when you ha have it, you kind of can realize that you can focus on uh, some other stuff. But I, I kind of, you know, the recenter in Oxford was really good. And then I, I graduated and I was like, what the hell do I do with my life now? I mean, I, I've lived in Oxford a combined total of 10 years. I'm 31 or 32. I don't want to be some townie here. And my buddy, I'm back at a funeral from my buddy's grandfather in Monroe, Louisiana in like October of 15. And my buddy, Sean Fox, who does sports radio in Monroe, who I grew up with, hits me with uh, like, what do you think about moving to Shreveport? And I'm like, first thing I think is like, well, I got the horseshoe poser. I can play poker there. So like, that was my first instinct. He's like, well... They got this sports radio job open that they want to hire me, but I'm, I got a wife and a kid here. I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to recommend you for this job. And I'm like, well, Sean, I've done an hour of sports radio in my entire life. He's like, doesn't matter. Your, your personality is perfect for it. You got, you know, a ton about sports. Like you'll be really good at it. So I go interview for this job and I get it. And, uh, it was called the, the 100.7 little, little, I'll call it like a single A station, you know, kind of rookie league in Bozier. And they give me a three hour radio show and I have no experience. And how long do you have to prepare for your first show? So our first show, I got like 20 pages of notes. No, but how, how long between the time you were hired until your first show hit the air? Uh, I think I got hired late October and it started like December 10th or 15th. Okay. So you have 20 pages of notes ready. By the way, doing three hours of radio by yourself is very hard. Dude. Like I make fun of Colin Coward a lot because he's a fake soup guy but the reality is you you have to prepare so much that's so much airtime to fill especially if you don't have like a producer you're going back and forth yeah with. and once you do especially if you do, like at the beginning i knew five people in shreveport so i just show up there i don't know nobody i know nobody i mean i call one of my old my friends uh my friend kathy king who i'm still close with i hadn't seen him since 07 and i basically show up on his doorstep in shreveport my first day i got like 10 pages of notes I'm so nervous. The show starts at 2 p.m. I have Sean Fox on the line in case I bomb. I run through the notes so fast I have to get Sean on at 2.04. Mm -hmm. And my first, I'll, I'll just call it, I'm, <laughs> I'm always very transparent. Like, I'll tell you when it's good. I'll tell you when it's bad. You, you're like that too. And the first nine or ten months of the show, I was terrible. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I was trying to get through three hours a day. And then that, first, that next football season, I started doing play-by-play -play for 5A high school, and I love doing that and miss doing that to this day. I, you think Gus Johnson got hyped on the air? You should have seen me at these these, these football games. I mean, I, I, I mean, it just I get so hyped with it. But what I realized, and this is something Erica preaches at Barstool a lot, you can't fake passion in life. And the, the radio show evolved. Instead of me talking to some beat writer about Louisiana Tech practice, I'm like, let's talk about fantasy football and gambling and going to see concerts and – you know, rest, you know, mute food or whatever. And it got really good as I started talking about, it. you could tell through the air, like, Hey, I give, I give a crap about that. And your listeners feel that. And I ended up building it into something, you know, I'm not going to sit here and say like the first year I made like 14 K. I mean, I was so broke. I was like going home, stay with my mom on weekends, just barely getting by. But you know, I, my dad always taught me uh, the best way to grow is just really Put, poured into your community and I just started showing up at community events using my platform to support that and through that when you show you care about other people then it comes back on you it's like when you live for the greater good you're the richest person in the world thing mm -hmm. and people saw I cared and I picked up a bunch of sponsors and you know ended up having a four-year run there and uh it, it was a good run uh you know, I'm not saying I was getting rich, obviously, but I got to, dude, I got to talk about, you know, just lucky, luckiest dude ever talking about gambling and football for a living. Yeah. Were you still, we still the, doing like online poker? Or not like really. That? And this is when the health got bad. In Shreveport, I was eating, drinking a bunch of craft beers all the time, eating Mexican food. And I really gained a bunch of weight mm -hmm. uh, those three or four years. I mean, I was, I didn't see a weight, but I mean, I probably got to 300 uh, at one point. Um, funniest story I want to share on the, the, that happened to me in Shreveport on the air though. So I, quarterfinal or second round playoff game uh airline was the high school i, I work i've worked for we're down in south louisiana at santa it's called it looks like it's saint amont it's actually santa Monica because the cajuns mm -hmm. we're at the pit in south louisiana 
I'm going to get this clip for this too. So can we get this clip? Yeah, I'll, I'll get, I'll get, I'll send it to you. All right. So anyway, you'll, thir- get, you'll get it yourself. Yeah, yeah I'll find okay. it for you. Right. Third quarter, we're like, the, the other team's 10 and one. We're an underdog. And uh, we were on a jet sweep for an 80 yard touchdown. And I'm on the second floor of this little press box. And I, I mean, I take it up to like a hundred on the air. I'm like, you're, you know, it's a 78 yard touchdown by Kobe McGee. And your new score is airline 27, Santa Monica 13. And then our coaches were up in that press box too, like jumping up and down. So all of a sudden, I look up, and this like old, kid, this like sixty year old Cajun man's walking toward me, and I don't think nothing of it. I mean, I'm mm-hmm. just like on the air, and he literally walks up to me, and just goes, Whack! <laughs> and he slaps the crap out of my shoulder while I'm on the air, and my my radio mic's hot, and y'all are gonna catch this when I get this clip. Assault? He, no, he goes, <laughs> boy. I don't care where you're from. The way you're hollering, they can hear you all the way in knowledge. <laughs> and I go from like a 30 on the air hyped to like so flustered when the kickers kick the extra point. I'm like, extra point is up. It, 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 it's good. Your score is airline 28. <laughs> Set about 13. Uh-huh. But uh, yeah, dude, dude just slapped the crap out of my shoulder. And my broadcast partner, instead of helping me, he's just on the ground crying. Yeah. He's laughing so hard. Like this can't, this can't even be real, but that was kind of my favorite. Uh, that's definitely the most memorable thing. It got me. I'm that's still talked about at airline for the Viking star senior receiver and your new score. It's airline 27 Santa Ma 13 with 251 left in the third quarter on an amazing run by Kobe McGee. Hey, if y'all can't keep, keep the noise down up here, stopping, I'm going to get y'all out, out of here. <laughs> Your new score, airline. He already slapped me. Airline twenty-seven. So I'm flustered. Saint Amant thirteen. Uh, air, airline Tinka's kicker. Tinka's now on the field. On the on the field to kick the extra point for the Vikings. Well, kick is up. Kick is good. I love Your new score. Oh, he's still going. I don't care what you say. I just understand. Airline twenty-eight. <laughs> Now leading, thir- uh, it's 28-13. We're going to take a 60-second timeout. Your new score, airline 28-13 over Santa Ma. Listen, airline Vikings playoff football, 100.7 FM. All right. Uh, um, Billy and Donnie, I want to open it up to you guys because uh, Mincy's obviously got, like, so many stories he's going through, but I'm sure you guys have some questions I want to know what it was like well, interacting with college-age student body uh, while you were there. Like, how, like, did people know – were you in classes and just like the oldest guy there? Like, what was that like? Man, I was so like I never go to class. Dur- dur- when I went, yeah, when you never older, went to class you know, when, when, I, when you were thirty-one. I, 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 no, no, when I was older, I went. Uh, it, it was like Van Wilder minus the women, you know, a little bit. <laughs> no, I mean it was funny, man, because me we lived like right off the square. We always had late. I mean, we had a party house at thirty or th- we we had a big time at thirty or thirty. Wait, wait, you were party? We a, I mean, I, I party. I, I partied harder at thirty or thirty-one than I did when I was twenty-one and twenty-two there. For sure. Yeah. When you were 31, were you ever going back to the frat house that you No, to? I wasn't doing the frat house deal, but we lived a block from all the bars. And so, okay. and then I, so there's this bar called the round table where, uh, basically my, my godson's uncle. So it was a family friend was a bartender and I just got to be friends with all the bartenders there through him. They were all like 22, 23 and I was broke. I'd go in there with not a dollar in my wallet, and just get freaking housed at this college bar all the time. I mean, it was, uh, it was, it was fun. And then that, and not a coincidence. I went back in 14, 15, right during the good freeze years when old Miss beat Bama. Like that was part of my logic on going back. Cause I knew we were going to be good. Yeah. And uh, got to go. I love that. I love no, that. it. Was. Mincy went back to school because the football program I knew was, was, was projected to win 10 games. I mean, <laughs> it, it got to go to both Bama games and we won, you know? Um, but yeah, that was, I mean, honestly, like I said, it was wilder at 30 or 31 then. Cause when I was 22, 23, I was just worried about poker. You should go back for your master's degree. If they're ever favored to like win a national championship. I feel like this is, I don't know like natty wise, but I mean, I'm about to win 10. It's about as good as good as it gets for the rebels. But when, when you're saying that, like you would get after it pretty hard, um, was it mostly beer? Uh, yeah, I mean, mostly, you know, I definitely, uh, I mean, I, I probably, you know, I, I, I don't want to get it. I was, don't go too hard at it, but I, I I had a good time. I probably overdid it a little bit. The mm. people, I feel like we've been getting a mostly sanitized version of the Mincy Mania experience so far. The people want to know. Yeah, I mean, it triggered some other stuff. Like, the thing with alcohol for me, and we'll get to this when I, like, quit it. I mean, it, I wasn't, like, an alcoholic. I mean, I drank a couple days a week. It just always would, like, trigger me wanting to do other stuff, too. Mm-hmm. And, uh... 
you know, buy, and it would just go off after I'd have two or three beers. Like I'd want to dabble and, you know, we're not going to, you know, Nose you, do, yeah, you can, you can use, <laughs> you can use your imagination. Mm -hmm. And that was the problem for me was that alcohol, like it was like the catalyst, like alcohol would sit up here and it would lead to like nine or 10 other different problems in my life. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so, but, but alcohol was like, what well, would trigger it. Yeah. And so it would make me like want to do other stuff. It would make me like crave carbs and be overweight and, you know, just ruin weekends. And did you ever uh, get in any trouble with the law? Uh, I, I got really nothing too bad. I got out of a DUI. I should have gotten a DUI. I'm a fifth year at Ole Miss, and uh, I, I got pulled over and was going to get one. And I like told a cop a lie that I was about to graduate in May. And they the guy took felt sorry for me and like drove me around for an hour and I blew under because he drove me around for an hour. He drove you around, letting you get lower. Yeah. Did you ever? Did you talk to him? Uh, yeah. During that drive around. Uh, yeah, we were. I was saying about. I was like, this is gonna be really hard for me to find this job in May. If I get this DUI in March. Yeah. Uh, he felt bad, and I didn't graduate in May, but I did. I is that I standard police procedure? No. <laughs> no, I got really it's lucky. Not. I got really lucky on that. Um, but yeah, I didn't get too, too bad a league. You know, I was lucky, uh, for all my faults. I didn't get too, too bad of, uh, too bad illegal stuff. You know, that was, that was, I got kind of lucky on that. I feel like. Yeah. So was it when you were working in Shreveport that Portnoy found that clip of you and hired you? So that's my 2020 is where it gets really wild in the story. But yeah. Let's, let's not skip the, uh, the years between then. Okay. So, so, so you, I did the four years of Bozier. You blow up a little bit in, in Shreveport. Yeah, but I was like local. So locally, it was fun. Everybody knew me locally everywhere I went. I was like a local slap. Were you yeah. showing up to like car dealerships and shit? Yeah, I do it everything. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I had this injury. It turned out uh, Devin White's attorney uh, that, you know, the Bucks linebacker was my title sponsor. Shout out Kyle Robinson, injury attorney. Um, <laughs> Morgan, Morgan. Yeah. yeah. So, I, you know, I, I was doing well on Streetboard, but what really blew me up was I started going, okay, so you know T-Bob Baybear a little bit, right? Yeah. Okay. So in 2013, I met T. Bob A. Bear, who LSU's you know center does ESPN Baton Rouge. Uh, his dad was Bobby A. Bear, Saints quarterback. So I meet him at this Mardi Gras party in 2013, and we partied till the sun came up. And that one of those things, the first night you you meet someone, you're like, I'm going to be friends with this guy. Mm -hmm. So in early 2017, I was like, I want to come on your show off the bench of Baton Rouge and be the gambling picks guy. And I got the I started doing that. This was a weekly segment on Thursday mornings. But ESPN Baton Rouge is like LSU flagship, one of the bigger radio stations in the South. I think you've been on. I know Big Cat goes yeah. on there. So I got super hot with the gambling picks the first month, and it ended up being like a segment for four years. And that got that's what got my name out because otherwise I would have just been in Shreveport, Bossier, like local. Mm -hmm. And so that ties into this. So 2020, right as COVID's about to hit. I get a phone call and I get fired. They decided to change the station to like a, you never want to hear station reformat change. They mm -hmm. changed it to some soft rock or some BS. So this is like March 9th or 10th, right as COVID hits. For like 24 hours, I get like five instant job offers. I, I take a job at the ESPN Baton Rouge to be the number three with T-Bob and Jordy on the phone. And the next day, the whole world shuts down. Mm -hmm. So the world shuts down, jobs go away because all the marketing, you know, everything shuts down. And so I had this big decision. I was like, all right, well, what the hell do I do with my life now? I was like, uh, the street board year is over, whatever. I did four years. I got as far as I could. And I remember South Louisiana got lit up by COVID because Mardi Gras. And mm -hmm. so I was like, well, time to move back to Oxford, Mississippi for the third time. So I go back in 2020 because I figured that'd be a low key place during COVID. And online poker blows up during COVID. And so I was like, I'm just playing online poker at Oxford 2020. I was like, like it was 2006. I was like, I've, have I evolved none at all? Mm -hmm. I was like, 14 years later, I'm still doing the same exact thing. I feel like I've evolved. But it was uh, the biggest thing, though, that happened during that time was it was almost like rehab for me in life. And COVID was hitting overweight people real hard, you know, and that was a big thing. And I was, I think I was like 300 pounds around then. And late April, I was like, you know what? I'm going to quit drinking for three months and just use this COVID time to lose weight, eat healthy, get in shape. Why not? Why not use it productively? Mm -hmm. So I've been drinking and partying for like 21 years and it took about six weeks for the brain fog to lift. Cause I'd gone real hard for a long time. And in like early June, I started feeling like rain man when I was a kid, I just felt this like fog lift and I just felt like super sharp and energetic again. And I was feeling good. And then I get a phone call from Jimmy Ott, ESPN Baton Rouge in early July. Like, Hey, I got this new show, a gambling show. I want you to be my number two. And I was like, I'll see you in 10 hours. Just mm -hmm. instant move to Baton Rouge. What was your setup like in Oxford? Like how long did it actually take you to move? No, oh, I was living in my buddy's house. I mean, I just packed a bag and 
was gone. So you were living just out of like a suitcase. Yeah, but I mean, I was I was living in a furnished house. So yeah. yeah, but I just so I get to Baton Rouge, I immediately lay it out like, hey, like everybody knows I like to party. Don't buy me drinks at the bar. Like I'm really taking this serious, you know, et cetera. And things were going real well in Baton Rouge. And uh, I honestly, ESP in Baton Rouge was the job I wanted. You know, I've been in Bozier. I was like, I hope I live here three to five years. This is great. And I got LASIK surgery late September. And then I feel like that's like a metaphor for the new start, new beginning. And then the next week, I'm watching Ole Miss, Kentucky in the Garden District of Baton Rouge. And I was living with our uh, old buddy, Martin Black, Playboy Marty, who went with me to Barstool. And he, this is like the ripples in the pond of life. He was at a wedding in New Orleans the night before, and he walks in right as Ole Miss, Kentucky's going to overtime. If he hadn't been there, the video never would have happened. Mm -hmm. And Ole Miss, Kentucky misses an extra point. Ole Miss wins an OT. And I rip a video of just me jumping up and down with a hottie toddy, just fired up. I mean, I was really pumped, but also thought it was funny for social media, whatever. Mm -hmm. And I don't think nothing of it, you know, just like whatever. And then the next morning, I'm driving to Natchez, Mississippi to do the with Rohan to go do the Sunday morning NFL show with Rohan Davey, old NFL quarterback, Baton Rouge guy, great dude. And my phone goes off like a nuclear cannon. And I look down and it's Dave Portnoy retweeting uh <laughs> SEC football hits different. It's my dumb ass yelling the hottie toddy mm -hmm. at the TV. And then I get a thing that Dave followed me on Twitter. I'm like, what's going on here? And then I get a DM from Dave and it's just like, is that you in that video? And I said, damn right, that's me. He's like, we want you to come work for us at Barstool. Wow. It was that that quick, no interview, nothing. And then Dave calls me. The next day I'm in Natchez, like standing on the bluffs over the river. It was kind of like a picturesque, beautiful view. And I said, hello. And the first thing Dave says to me is, goes, your voice sounds exactly how I hoped it would with the, with, <laughs> with the gravelly Southern drawl. And Dave said, he goes, listen, I, I don't know everything about life, but I know how to find talent. You're my guy. It's uh -huh. the first thing he told me. And he gave me the option of moving to New York or not. And at first I was like, oh, I could live in the South and do this. And then I was like, wait, what kind of a shitty, soft attitude is that? You grind four years in Bozier City and you have a chance to go in the Barstool office in New York. Like, you got to do it. You know, you got to do it. So fourth city I lived in in 2020. I did three months each, Shreveport, Oxford, Baton Rouge, New York. Uh -huh. Had three different jobs. Got fired in March. Got hired by Barstool. All in one year during the pandemic. So My 2020 you, was bananas. So so you go up to New York, but then you also kind of, you still had a lot of time that you spent in the South. Oh, yeah, yeah. For sure. Y'all saw that. But yeah. uh, <laughs> but no, the New so, York- Walk me through that thought process, because I know that eventually you had, you had it out with Dave about how much time you're spending outside the office versus inside the office. But at the start, did you just, you didn't think that it would be an issue if you were just like in the South for like five days a week and then you drop into New York? Well- he okay. he had to bring the sports book to the people. Well, that this was this was before before that. that. Oh, yeah. Okay. Before well, no. Well, at people. first, I was there the first couple of months. It was it was it was that spring where it you know the, the original Mitzi tour where I think I did yeah. like two weeks going to college baseball games where he started uh, started messing with me a little bit. The New York thing was interesting though. I'd only spent one night in New York in my entire life before I moved up there. Mm -hmm. C C panic in 2011, <laughs> passing passing through there. Um, but you know, you, you miss all the shots you don't take in life. And y'all just been awesome to me in the office since day one, all y'all included just, you know, I felt like I fit in from was, the beginning. Was there ever any animosity between Brandon Walker and yourself when you first got hired? Because I think that's like the untold ripple effect behind the Mincy hire. Oh, Brandon didn't do well at Barstool. I never would have gotten hired. Was the previous, uh, hire of Brandon who was only hired because it was at a revenge. Once Dave got into a spat with Brandon's former employer. And then Brandon carried himself real well on that live stream, got hired. And then Dave and Brandon had, you know, they had a little beef going back and forth. And so Dave was like, I found this other guy from Mississippi. He seems like he's an electric guy. He would be good for the company. And he's got the added bonus of pissing Brandon Walker off. So what was Brandon's uh, welcome to you like once you got here? I, so Brandon, what's fun, which, what I love about Brandon, it's funny, is uh, the only thing we have in common is we like football and we're from the South. Can't be more different people. Mm -hmm. I mean, just that. And, you know, Brandon, he he is the Irritable State fan. I've been seeing those people my whole life. But, I mean, it, it's not an act. I mean, he's, you know, he he's the bitter State fan that hates Ole Miss. And, you know, at first, my mannerisms and stuff definitely annoyed him, for sure. Mm -hmm. Probably still still do. Uh, you know, we'd get we'd really go at it on the streams and stuff. But, you know, it, it never got too – I don't – I mean, I know I annoyed the crap out of him. I, there's no <laughs> doubt about it. I mean, I still do. But, you know, I never felt like 
unwelcome around him. Yeah. Too, 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 too bad. I think he likes you. I think so too. I think he grew to, yeah. I think he grew to at the beginning. I, you know, he's probably like, how the hell is you know, this guy here? Yeah. Um, but you know, for the most part, I think it's been good. I, the funniest thing with Brandon and me though, is that stream where I last, where I read, did the cowbell in his face mm-hmm. when state dropped the touchdown pass and missed that field goal. And he lost my mind and called me a fat retard. And, uh, yeah, that was, that was, he, he didn't like me very much then. Mm-hmm. No, no. But yeah, moving to New York must have been quite the change during you, the during you, the pandemic too. Yeah, you had lived down south your whole life. Um, how, like, how did you find that transition? What were you doing for fun? Were you trying to make friends outside of the office? I had one close friend I grew up with who's like a lawyer for a hedge fund that I kicked it with a lot. Um, but that first few months, man, everything was shut down. It was during the heart of COVID. Yeah, uh, I mean, I kept it pretty pretty low key. I wasn't doing too too much exciting. Uh, kind of opened back up that next year, and you know, I'd go see some music and mm-hmm. do some stuff. But it was a little bit of a weird. The New York thing was weird for me. I'm not going to sit here and lie. It, the barstool stuff's been great, and I get along with everybody here. And it wasn't that. It was just I didn't I didn't have a life outside of being barstool mincy in New York, mm-hmm. and that is what I had in New Orleans, where I have you know 25 friends that go 15 years back. But Chicago, I already don't feel that way at all. I think it's awesome. Like I mm-hmm. think Chicago is a different. Uh, different vibe. And then you also moved in with Billy around that time, right? Yeah. So that that was the next year. Uh, yeah. I moved across the hall from Billy, which was great. Lo- loved yeah. being around Billy day to day. I mean, it was. Uh, Did you hear like weights clanging in the kitchen? You'd hear weights clanging. Noises. You'd hear Whitey the dog a good bit. The hedgehog. Yeah. You'd get all that. But it was, dude, it was fun. Billy and I have a great relationship. At least, yeah. at least I think of we do. Of course right, we Billy? do, Ben. We had a small hiccup, but yeah, we're good now. There, there was a little iciness. Yeah, at, well, you at know, all, they're all for breakups. I was just sad Ben was leaving. Well, when you, that was a big thing. But we had some great and then when times you, living in Hoboken together. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I thought that, like I said, the New York thing, you know, I, it wasn't for me long term, obviously. I jumped at the first chance when I, my new contract came up, like, to get back to New Orleans. I mean, I jumped at that mm-hmm. for sure. Um, I think you jumped a little too fast, though, because you forgot to tell your landlord you were moving out. You just moved to New Orleans. Yeah, and still had a lease, but he yeah. filled it. He filled was it. Was that a problem? <laughs> I filled it. it was, that was a little. That was a little bit of me and Billy's little fallout. I don't think Billy liked the new roommate very much. Yeah. But okay, but uh, it got smoothed over eventually. Okay, um, but you know the New York thing. Like I said, it, it was it was a very culturally being from Louisiana. I mean, it was a lot. What was the weirdest thing about New York? The weirdest thing about New York to me was you couldn't relax anywhere. Like when you're like walking around, like where do you pee? Where do you like lay out on a couch and stretch your legs? Like it was just. All so like hyper intense. It sounds like the complaints a dog would have. Where do you do that anywhere? <laughs> no, but just in general, like New York, everybody's like so busy. On Is there any own... water out here on the sidewalk? I no, but they're like everybody's like, so busy on their own schedule. It was just like a weird culture thing. Like in yeah, York, I know, every, I know what you're saying. You're like people schedule like, oh yeah, let's get dinner in 17 days at 6:30 one night. Like the way people are with their calendars and stuff. Yeah, yeah. It was a really, uh, really you know weird thing. But I, I don't know. It just it it wasn't. I don't know. It just wasn't, wasn't for me. Just mm-hmm. the the. You, you thought the New York office was a little negative too. You know how a we, little bit. We yeah, kinda, we kind of thrive off the drama, off the negative energy sometimes. But I thought I thought it, I thought it was, but I mean, I don't have any beef. You know, I didn't really ever have any like too bad of beefs with anybody in Barstool. Yeah. Uh, but it just the culture in the Chicago one's different for sure. It's a little more positive. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so you go do- back down south. And um, it's like, this is another Mincy rebirth almost. Oh, dude. Well, the thing is, I wanted to do NOLA so bad because I I screwed it up so bad on the way out when I left in the fetal position. And so I wanted to have my NOLA a couple of years where I like proved I could do it and like get revenge for how it ended. Yeah. And we only made it nine or 10 months. Obviously we had a little hiccup in the middle of it, but, but uh, let's talk about that. So, um, so Arian's seen your, your greatest hits compilation. (laughs) He watched wake up Mincy. Uh, it was what what day was it? It was May the first. May first of the month. First of the I know, month. I know it was the first of the first month. First of the month. And so you had uh, you were on a tear. I think you had done Wake Up Mincy for what like a two week? and a half weeks. Two and a half weeks. Yeah, it was the most notorious two and a half week show in Marshall. Yeah. And, and you, uh, well, actually, you were it was doing because the van talk was more notorious because y'all's damn weird. damn yeah. No, he's right. Damn, he's right. He, well, I came mean, into your studio wake up, talking to you like wake, that. Wake Up Mincy might have caused more of a stir. Um, your first yeah, you you two take and half, the pen stock. Yeah, your first two and a half weeks. You're um, you're off to a hot start. I think you did a majority of your shows live. There were a couple that you pre-taped. Yeah, it's a pre-taped. Well, yeah, yeah. That that caused a little bit of a stir because it's supposed to be a live morning show. Um, and so you, you pre-taped one of them, and then the bosses said, "Mincy, if you're going to do a live morning show, you got to do a live morning show." The next day for your show was May first, 
and you decided to sing first, first of, month, of the month. As a joke. Why did you? Uh, Why did you pick that song? Because it was the first of the month. I thought it'd be funny. That makes sense. That's a good. That's yeah, that was a good that was that was the it. that was the point. And it was like a watching a train wreck because I like had flown back from Raleigh at like one a.m. from a wedding the night before, and I was like on low sleep and. You know, I had my show prepped and all that, but I guess I wasn't thinking as clearly. And I literally was just looking at my phone and just slipped mm -hmm. on slipped on a lyric, you know. And um, the second, and, and the world changed a lot. The second after you said it, you can see like oh, your, your yeah. brain pauses. Oh, for a dude, second. It's bad. what's yeah. going what's going through your head in that moment? I mean, you tried like to, all, yeah. all but pan I, I tried to get through the show, but I mean, I knew what was coming. Uh, I was pretty pretty panicked. Um, Dave called me right after actually was super calm on the phone with me, which helped me. He was like, look, just apologize. Obviously you made a mistake, but I know you would never do that on purpose. Like he actually made me feel better about it. Um, that next couple of hours were real rough. Like I was kind of having some panic attack stuff. One of my friends came over and kind of calmed me down. Um, but, and then by that afternoon I was doing a little better. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the next day, uh, I sent Erica Nardini like a five paragraph, like buttoned up apology. Just like, I really appreciate working here and I know I'm putting you through a lot and I'm so sorry. Mm -hmm. And she sent back an email and said, don't ever effing do it again. It was obviously a mistake though. And when she said that, I was like, okay, I'm not getting fired basically. Mm -hmm. And then Dave calls me on Wednesday morning, like, Hey, uh, you know, I fought hard for you, but I don't know what Penn's going to do. And right when he said that, I'm like, okay, I'm getting fired for sure. Well, like that was like him washing his hands of it. I thought, and then Erica FaceTimed me like literally in tears when she told me she was, I was getting let go. She said, I fought Penn for 48 hours as hard as I could for you. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I was kind of, I was not as down as you'd think. Um, yeah. Right. yeah can we, let's back up to Can I, I share I, a story about that? Or, yeah. Yeah. Well, just after you got fired, I felt horrible. I was like, he's got to be devastated. So I called you up and I was like, Mincy, so sorry to hear the news. And you were like, yeah, it sucks. But you know what? Like, Jazz Fest is coming up. Like, <laughs> well, this is actually perfect time. Yeah, no, well, now I can just go to Jazz Fest well, every day. No, it was the funniest part is I was supposed to be on Barstool's most dangerous games in Colorado, which I did not want to do no. at all. And it ended up hearing horror stories about it. Uh -huh. And uh, I actually was like 255 pounds then, and I'd heard skydiving was involved, and you had to be under 250. Mm -hmm. So I made sure I kept my weight over it because so I wouldn't be able to do it. <laughs> And so, like, when I got let go, I'm like, well, now I get to do Jazz Fest all weekend instead of doing the show. So, but, like, it's like mental gymnastics. You just, like, yeah. spin everything positively. And uh, I remember I texted Big Cat from a J-Rad show Thursday night, like, J-Rad's the best dead band. And he's like, the whole world's waiting on you, your next tweet. And you're like, talking about dad. I'm like, yeah. I mean, yes. What, yeah. Else would, what, what else would I do, you know? Yeah. Big Cat was, he was a little worried because right after it happened, you had all these people reaching out for like and offering you jobs because you were all over Twitter, all over social media. And you were just like, I think I'm just going to wait a couple months and then choose my next move. And Big Cat was like, if you wait a couple months, you might not have these opportunities. Well, you, you got to strike while the iron's hot. What was really interesting about it was after it happened, I was like, I better get my poker game sharp because I'm not going to get hired for five years uh, off what happened. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't like that at all. I think I, I just run that you know, and you, I appreciate your support. But the week before I'd run that 10 K and raised 50 K for hogs for the cause. And I think a lot of people had saw that. And I think I got a little bit of the benefit of the doubt on what happened more than most. Yeah. Um, and then I had a bunch of job offers immediately, which felt good. And I took the poker go thing. Cause I thought that'd be a great six weeks bridge in Vegas while I figured it out. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I, what scared everyone was I went ghost on social media for like 10 or 11 days, but that was actually just because my attorneys told me to shut up till I signed my severance. Yeah. Okay. And so one, so, but that freaked everybody out. Cause I'm always, it's not like you. Yeah, yeah. People were like worried, but I got my severance figured out. And then Dave called me the next day and offered me the brick watch thing. And I immediately knew like Dave's my guy. He found me. I'm this is like, the greatest wait, this, deal this of like all time. This is like a head coach getting fired. You, you were getting severance and a new job. Cut. Severance and hired back the next yeah, day. And I and I and I work for poker. <laughs> I had like three jobs to some. I mean, this, this guy, this is a better deal than Jimbo. Fisher. Yeah, it was unreal. Yeah. Uh, and all you had to do was say a racial Dude. slur. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I mean, it was pretty crazy. So uh, wait, wait, I want to give you an opportunity to talk about that because you've talked about how sorry you are and how like how that's one of the biggest regrets of your life. Is, hell yeah, is, is that moment. Um. So it, a, after you say that. Do you try to think of a way to like explain yourself out of it or like were people, did you receive any feedback from people that you're close with that were actually hurt that you said that? Nobody was. That was what was crazy. I thought there'd be like a huge thing against me and other than Penn, it never came. 
Mm-hmm. Do, do, do an ancestry.com just in case. Uh, I did not, but I did have a lot of, uh, I had, I mean, at least 40 African-Americans reach out to me saying they felt bad. (laughs) No, they were like, they knew like people, people like everywhere I go, like people I didn't even know, like would see me in public and be like, dude, you got screwed. (laughs) Crazy. (laughs) At least least 40. Yeah, no, it was a ton. That's like the feral hogs tweet. Yeah. No, no, it was a ton. It was like, no, everybody felt bad for me. 30 to 50 African-Americans. No, it was a ton. Like people I knew and people I knew and people I didn't know. Like it was like a thing. I mean, I, I don't want to like get into like the discussion of, of saying that word in that context as a white it's guy. Never okay. it, it it's never okay. It's never okay. Yeah. Just, it was just but, a mistake. It was context. But Ari- Arians laughed about it a few times uh, over the course of the show um, and just about like finding out more about you and finding out what the what the controversy was. Arian, you have any you have any questions or anything you'd like to you'd like to address with him regarding that? Because I, I shouldn't say anything about it. it doesn't word doesn't mean anything to me. No, nah, I'm not the fucking word police or the black people spokesman uh you should be the latter though i should be the black people spokesman you are for me anyway i got you cat um (laughs) nah i i I assume all white people said i they just i I think all y'all said in your in your leisure time uh they could be accurate could not be accurate but i just assume no, all white no. Say it. It. I, I never I, said that. I, I literally Dude, never. That was what was crazy. It was just because I, I was reading it. the lyrics. You know what's the funniest thing? Ben used it. to censor himself when we were listening to rap music, like at the apartment when it was just us two. He'd be singing it, and then he'd just like stop. And I always found it funny because it was just us two. Not that he would <laughs> say it, because because I didn't. He I was so <laughs> no, 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 no. I didn't find it funny because I was saying it. I find it funny because like he would make such an effort to be like. That just be like, and not say it, and like be looking around. <laughs> so what had happened? I was yeah, like, what's that cap? I don't know. I assume I assume all white people say that shit. I assume everybody said it. it's like what's intriguing to me is like it's the only racial slur that has become cool. I and it's it's obvious because we did it right. We made it cool, but it's like we don't walk around saying like, "What up, wet back?" You know, like it's just it just don't hit yeah. the same. Like nobody, no other. No other race wants to say another racial term as a term of endearment. It's fascinating to me. It's fascinating. Yeah. Well, so anyway, so by May, I, I'm getting rehired by Brick Watch. Things are going well. I have like I do the video in front of the Gleason statue announcing the Brick Watch thing on my 40th birthday. Things are looking up. And then I had a dark, I'm going to share a little of this. I had a dark stretch in June. June was real tough on me where I lost a really good friend of mine to a car wreck right before the barstool thing. And then my buddy's dad who hired me at airline and I'm real close. Son was my play by play guy. I died of cancer young had those two things, the barstool scandal, a couple other, you know, some other stuff going on in Vegas. And then I was kind of spiraling mentally and I was living in the Flamingo in Vegas. You don't want to be spiraling in Vegas. And like in June, I don't know how it looked to everyone else. I think I covered it up pretty good, but I wasn't doing well for like three weeks. Uh, and what happened, and this is where we get in the second act stuff. It was like the turn in 40 was part of it. And then uh, I was like spiraling kind of bad and wasn't eating well and was gaining weight and just, just not in a good headspace. And I went to Red Rocks in late June and just like getting in the mountain air and uh, just kind of hit the reset button where I was like, dude, quit being a little bitch. Like, what are you like upset about? Look how far you've come to get here. Like bad stuff happens to everybody in life. This shit ends right now. And like right out of Red Rock, started eating healthy, lifting, running, you know, all that. Like last 19 days of Vegas, like got through it pretty good. And it was all like heading really, really, really positively. And then I had a huge, huge weekend in Huntsville, Alabama in late July when I did the panic run there where, that was where I decided during the first set I was going to run the St. Jude half marathon. And I had, what, what was that like? What was that decision? Like you're listening to widespread panic. I was just and all like, of a sudden you're like, you know what? I'm going to do a marathon. Yeah. I was just like thinking about everything. Uh, and I was just like, I was already feeling like all this positive energy. And I was like, the whole vision for the second act was that weekend. I had a big, big uh, out of body experience with it basically. And, <laughs> and the whole, can I, can I say the way that you phrased it to me earlier? And you can decide if we can keep this in or not. You got it. But you said, uh, you texted me and you said, I just had the second biggest trip of my life. And I've decided that I'm going to run the St. Jude Marathon. It's the second act of life. 
the whole premise of that like weekend was the second act. And it was all where I thought about everything in life. I have all these great friends and I family and I have everything, but I've just fought this damn hill thing my entire life. Like the weight, yo, yo. And And so what I realized the premise of it was if I make my health, my first, second, third, fourth, and fifth priority, I get it all. I get everything. And when I, I realized that, and since then, like, it's all I care about. I mean, every decision of every day is based on the health stuff. And I'm, you well, know, that and also your job, which you work very hard at. Yeah. And, sure and, and it was that. like, and it was also, it was cosmic. Like out of that weekend, I felt like, I almost felt like reborn coming back into the world that Monday and mm-hmm. Dave bought Barstool back the next week. I felt like it was like cosmic coming out of it. Do and, you think you had anything to do with that? Yeah, I, what Dave getting Barstool back? Yeah. 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 I think I I feel like things are already probably not going well with Barstool and Penn, but uh, the stock went from 32 to 24 the day they announced my firing, and I think they lost like 700 million that day because yeah, of you. I lost a lot, um, and I feel like that. You know, I'm not saying I'm the reason, but I, I'm I'm not like the reason, but like that was like maybe the ending. You know, the the straw that broke the back at the end, mm-hmm. possibly. And then Dave hires me back, and all of a sudden, you know, I was fired, gone for. I get hired back August 8th, and I look up, I'm like, man, I'm like killing the health thing. I'm back at Barstool. And what I realized was like the turning 40 and the Barstool scandal was the end of act one. And now this is, this is act two. It's a start of act two right now. Now the, the future is. And I'm coming is for, nice. I'm coming for everything. Like I'm, I get it all. I'm telling y'all. I what, get what it What are you all. getting? What are you talking about? Just it. Well, uh, I still do want to like eventually have a family and stuff. And I'm like, you know, definitely trying to take care of myself toward that mm-hmm. eventually. But I, I feel great where I'm at at Barstool. Uh, I think this thing, Wake Up Mincy's coming back December 5th. Uh, can't wait for that. 10 second delay? Uh, I think we're trying for 30 or 45. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Probably a good yeah, call. Yeah. But I get to be, and then Big Cat, you know, I came up to Chicago right after I got rehired. Big Cat sat me down and you talked to me too. And Hank did too. And Erica kind of pushed it. But just like, we're never going to tell you what to do with your life. But we think you'd be making a very bad career decision if you didn't move up here. And coming from y'all, I mean, like, of course I'm going to do that. You know, I'm looking mm-hmm. at it. And it felt like, you know, the second act's taking me to Chicago. And the second act's not just a thing for me. It's the Barstool thing. You know, Barstool's back with Dave and the new beginning in Chicago. It's a thing for all of us. Can we talk about some of your most viral moments, Mincy? We can talk about whatever you want. Okay. So uh, the Pelicans game where you're doing the unboxing. Okay. And you're down in the front row and – uh you're tearing the styrofoam apart. First of all, have you ever opened a box before? I never opened a bobblehead like that before. I didn't realize it was that styrofoam. I didn't know. Yeah, you just kind of tore into it like a like an animal, it, like, it like was, a bear like going into Like I said, it, just, it like started bad, and then it just kept getting worse. Yeah, and so the, the styrofoam starts to f- fall apart, flying through the air like a snow globe, landing on that poor guy right next to you the whole time. I can't believe he didn't react. That would have hit me. Yeah, you would have hit you. Yeah, yeah. I would have hit me. <laughs> like that guy who came up and slapped you in the shoulder. Yeah. So yeah. after the video is over, did you apologize to the guy? Yeah, apologize profusely. But it was funny. Right after the video was over, I was like, "Man, this one's gonna be a banger." You know, I knew immediately. <laughs> I was like, "This one's definitely getting posted." Like, this is gonna. Did be- you know it was a banger because of all the styrofoam? Yeah. Oh yeah. I was like, "Oh, people are gonna lose." Like right after it, I was like, "People are gonna have thoughts on this." <laughs> you know, and uh, yeah, they did. But the funniest part of that was I was wearing a Barstool Sportsbook hoodie. Yeah. And I like lost, it got so viral that I lost the Pelicans happy hour over oh, it. Oh my God. Yeah, you went too that. viral. I went too viral because they had all these other sportsbook sponsors and we weren't one. You did too good of a job promoting the Barstool yeah. Sportsbook where it was actually negative. Yeah. Uh, so some other great moments from, from Mincy. The Whistler. The Whistler. Tell me about the Vanderbilt. How... How long had you wanted to approach the Whistler and, and give well, him a I, I, That was about more than me. That was the whole SEC. Like, the, the joke on the Whistler thing was nothing. Everyone hates each other in the SEC, but they're all united in their hatred for the Vandy Whistler. Yeah. And so, uh, that was – he's just annoyed the crap out of everyone forever. And before the game, I was like, you know, I was doing college baseball content. I mean, my baseball career ended in right field when I was 14. Like, nobody wants to hear what I say if somebody's got a plus slider. It's about, you know, the content – I was like, so before the game, I declared war on the Whistler in a video. And I was like, I'm just going to go confront this guy on camera and see what happens. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did. And uh, a lot happened, to say say the least. Did you kill him? Uh, I don't know. I did not kill him. He's still alive. There's why is are they both alive? We didn't want did one of them die. They got two of them. There were two of them. There were one at them, one point multiple. I believe the main guy is still definitely alive. I saw I one of them at the tournament the next year. Um, but yeah, that was funny. It was like the one thing to unite the, the SEC was the hatred of the Vandy, the Vandy Whistler. 
I'm gonna keep this short and sweet. You should be ashamed of your behavior if you put yourself above. Everybody in the stadium, and you're a disgrace. That's all I have to say. That's what I got to say. Okay, you put yourself above. Hey, scoreboard. 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 Oh, see. Yeah, what would you say are your other most viral moments? Uh, the When I was sitting out in, in Omaha, the first Omaha thing, when I was doing the video and I said, this is 0-0 game, Jack Leiter has a no-hitter, and then a 400-foot home run. Goes oh, yeah. Yeah, that was a great one. Feels like the first team to score is going to have a great chance to win. With how strong these pitchers look, we're halfway home. Unbelievable game and atmosphere. A little slice of heaven in Omaha on an evening night. You can't beat it. As you say this, this is live. This is live. Ben Mintz talking about the pitcher's duel with Jack Leiter. He just gave up his first hit. You cursed him. I cursed him completely. I just said he's allowed no hits. And I had to go back in the stadium the next day, and I met Al Leiter, his dad, the old pitcher, and he was like, that was you who did that. Yeah, yeah. Did you, uh, did you think, like, was that still at the time when you thought that being wrong on camera was a bad thing? Yeah, no, I was, yeah, yeah. I, I, like, I was like, I, I did. At the time, I, I kind of was like, I don't know how I could show my face in the stadium. All these Vandy fans are sending me threats on Twitter yeah. and stuff. I was like, I don't even know how I can be in public. But that was when I learned that that's what you want. Being wrong on camera is, is usually way better. Yeah, than, and that's, than right. that's really a strength of mine. Like, I think I managed to make myself look like an idiot and rock it more than most. Yeah, what else we got? What are some of the other uh, iconic Mincy moments? Those those two were really uh, – let's see, what was the other good one? The, oh, the Dave showing up in the Arkansas gear. When, uh, when I lost all the college baseball bets yeah. in a row and Dave showed up in the Arkansas gear, I thought. Uh, I thought that was probably oh, – Oh, I know. Um, when uh, your buddy Ben Stein, no, my boy Alex broke. Stein. Yeah, that was. Uh, oh, Alex Stein. Yeah, that one. That was. Uh, that, that wasn't fun. It was fun to watch as as an outsider, but um, that was because I know like Big Cat and Peel were saying that you set the whole thing up, which I know <laughs> you didn't, but you Scott got no. you got very upset when people were accusing you of that. Yeah, that one. That that wasn't my favorite. You did uh -huh. kind of walk away when he came in. Watching watching the video. Oh, back, the video was damning. The video was uh, the evidence was damning. Where you're like, oh, I got to get out of here now. Yeah, uh, I, that wasn't good. Mm -hmm. That wasn't that wasn't my finest moment. Let's see what were some other really. Why did um Dave dethrone you as king of the south? Because it was the Stein thing. Oh yeah, that, he that, like that immediately was all did because it. Of yeah, the Stein. He did it immediately. Did it immediately. Yeah. Um, but those are some. But it's you know overall, man, the Barstool thing's been been awesome, and you know now, like I said, things are really really looking up and. You know, like I've got, I'm running St. Jude half marathon in uh, like 12 days, something like mm -hmm. that. And I mean, d dude, I was 300 pounds three years ago. And I'm about to run a half marathon. That's unbelievable. And I get to help, you know, people that are struggling with that. I feel like it gives me like a greater purpose. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I feel like now that I'm fixing the health stuff, my confidence and energy are on a level they've never been. Yeah. I'm very excited to see you run that. How, what time are we shooting for? So it's 13.1. Um, I mean, definitely under two and a half hours, but I, I mean, I can't do two. I did, I did the under hour 10 K, which is 6.2. Um, I mean, it's probably between two fifteen and two thirty. That's still a pretty good time. Dude, I'm not going to stop, you yeah. know? And, uh, and you know, I'm going to fundraise. We're going to drop a fundraising link on here, uh, for that. Cause you know, the, this is the right way to end the year is raising a lot of money to help these kids. So what goes through your head when you're running these, these long races, you talked about just rocking out. Like I'm you, just jamming you jam out, out, man. I set up these set lists and I like do build an arc with it where it starts slower. And then at the end, I'm just like raging, sprinting. It's like a whole thing. I, just, I love, I love your finishes when dude, you just, I just like yeah. sprint at the end. Yeah. I and just it's like, like your body is just like going a hundred miles per hour, like every limb going as fast as it can. Yeah, it, it, it's something to see. I'm going to, you know, I ran like a 7.30 mile the other day at the end. I mean, I'm, I was, I'm, I'm feeling really good about the half, but also on the health thing too, though, I used to just try to do the old, you can't outrun a bad diet thing. I'm sure that's the old thing you hear. Yeah. And now, you know, I, I run a couple less days a week and I lift weights to balance it. And I uh, finally, the biggest thing, this is, this is a interesting point to talk about is the addiction personality. I finally kicked the sugar addiction. Okay. And I feel like you the sure? sugar, the, yeah, okay. I, the sugar thing is like, I mean, it's the same as like, I feel like it's similar to like a blow addiction because it affects your dopamine. Oh, it is. Yeah. And like, I, it, you know, I started late June and the weeks three through five are hell because your first two weeks you're motivated, you're losing weight, but the weeks three through five, your body's like freaking out. But once you get through week five, your body gets to where you're used to it. 
And like now, like I maybe make one or two dot mistakes a week. I have it completely under control and I've just never felt better. Let's and, go. And so now it's like, I mean, I don't drink, I eat healthy, I lift, I run mm -hmm. 10 to 15 miles a week. And it's just, you know, I feel like, but by doing that, I get to live just such a great life and I'm gonna lose like 30 more. I'm I, or something like that. Do you think being baptized in the Mississippi River has helped at all? I feel like that was part of the cleansing. Okay. A little bit. <laughs> yeah. You know, and the, uh, that was fun, that rediscovering. Yeah, that was a lot. That's the only time I've been in the Mississippi River. Damn. It was nice. Yeah, that was right, fun. Right in the backyard of their casino in La Berge. Yeah, yeah La Berge. La Berge, Bat Baton Rouge. But it's, like I said, it's just overall a different mindset, though. Like, I'm talking about this. Like, I don't know if I'm explaining the second act thing right. I view life through a completely different prism now. And I still have a lot of fun. But it's just a way more about like being balanced, healthy. And what I found is I enjoy every minute of every day more. Like it's not like all just the epic stuff. It's like having a cup of coffee in the morning or, you know, eating breakfast is like one of my favorite things. It's it's just like every minute of every day is better. I mean, it's it's unbelievable. And I feel like, you know, I'm like anti-aging at 40 for where I was at 30 or 35. And I'm lucky I look I don't look that old and you know, and we're still just getting started with it. I mean, I can't wait to see what this, this 200 or 205 pound finished product you, is going to be. Some people say that you you like to talk a lot. I would agree with those people. I think that's fair. That would say that. So when you're on your own, when it's solo mincy time. I talk to myself. You do? Confirm. Oh, yeah, I put what, myself what are those conversations I'm just like? like uh, I, oh, yeah. People see me. I'm just, uh, oh, Confirmed. Billy's on it. Yeah. yeah. From the through the walls. I'm just like, just like today's going to be, early in the morning, I'm like, today's going to be a great day. We're going to go out. We're going to, you know. Positive affirmations. Yeah, mm -hmm. raise some hell. You know, I, I talk to myself in the shower. Do you ever I'll, have? I'll do you ever have like a conversation shower. with yourself? Like disagree with yourself? Kinda, yeah. You talk things out. Yeah, a little bit. Just like, why is your attitude about this so so poor? Like, yeah. You know, I just believe. Like another belief I want to mention real quick is like how how many people are in the world? A billion? I don't know. I think like close six, to seven eight. Billion. Okay, six seven billion. Okay, so we all share the world, and we're all like irrelevant in that aspect, but we're sharing the space of the world and it's the energy we pass through the space of the world that matters. And I like believe in bringing like the, the, if you, the positive energy thing just like spreads like wildfire, if you do it right and you can really like be a magnet and it goes everywhere and it can bounce off everything and affect a lot of stuff. And I'm real into that. I like that. It's a good attitude to have. Big T could learn from that. I feel like sometimes he's a little negative. He gets down. Maybe if you, I don't agree with that actually at all. You're being yeah. negative right now. Maybe maybe no, you're not disagreeing negative. with someone is not being negative. No, you're right, Donnie. Good point. I maybe that, you're yeah, just, you're, just you're, you're positive energy right now. You're too. completely mischaracterizing. I think maybe you're very monotone, so it sometimes comes off. No, as negative, I can confirm he's it he's very it negative. Mean... <laughs> okay, all right. How, how can confirmed. you confirm I mean, that, Billy? Whenever there's suggestions, it's just automatically shot down. <laughs> so one it's time, not, I, not one time. I disagreed times. with one of your your suggestions and that makes me a negative no, just person. like i th i'm i'm you could use some of mincy's mincy's down for anything you say hey mincy this so, is what we do i'll give big, hey i want to say one thing one thing on big t i'll say this i also believe in god and hell yeah i brother. Uh, i you know and I, I, we need that on this show i i think Wait, that, which god i mean i'm a christian like I, I feel like that's been part of this uh that came back in my life in 2018 and you know that has helped me a lot get over some addiction stuff and live for the greater good. And it's been a, it's a great part of my life. That's good to hear. Yeah. Mincy. Oh yeah. I Absolutely. love that. I'm um, taking for big T. I don't think big T's negative, man. I think he no. just likes what he's like. And he's, I don't either. By the shit that he's not, that he don't like. And I think his, his passive demeanor comes off as negative when I don't look at him as negative. I just, he, he likes what he likes. I agree with that. And I appreciate that. I'll, I'll say this. Big T does not tolerate nonsense. That's fair enough. Big T is the most anti-nonsense person that I, I think I've ever met in my entire That's life. That's fair. Anti-hijinks? Are you a fan Generally, of Generally, yeah. Okay. But a little nonsense can be good. You say anti-hijinks? Hijinks. 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 <laughs> what is hijinks? Hijinks. Hi shenanigans. Tomfoolery. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm not. No no Jake Malice sex You're stuff about You're here. about some good clean fun. <laughs> yeah. You're about good clean fun. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You like, but yeah, a little nonsense is good. I think, was that Alice in Wonderland that said that? There's a famous quote about nonsense I'm going to look at. Hang on one second. Right. Yeah, there was a lot of nonsense in Alice in Wonderland. That might be Dr. Seuss. I like nonsense. It wakes up the brain cells. Okay. Well, that guy was a weirdo. <laughs> you work at the right company then. 
<laughs> yeah. Dr. Seuss has not uh, been no canceled, his though, his right? propaganda yeah. during World War II. Uh, they're saying it's problematic. He did uh, have some very racist caricatures that that he that I he thought drew. that was Roald Dahl. Uh, also mm-hmm. him. Okay. But, yeah, no, Roald canceled. Dahl said some terror. Well, Remember we read well, it on air the other day. Yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Doctor yeah. yeah. Seuss just but had Doctor Seuss pretty interesting illustrations of Japanese people during World War II. I don't know if that is like of the times because. That- no, I, th- I think they, races, bro. yeah, they removed those from a lot of schools, but like, you can still read every, you can still read, Oh, the places you'll go. The butter battle cat in the hat. Like those are all still out there. Those are classics, mm-hmm. but you just can't read like the Dr. Seuss propaganda. Love the, love the art, not the artist, man. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, I want to get back into just some Q and a stuff with Mincy before we do is brought to you by C4. That's appropriate. The ultimate energy. Ben Mintz is synonymous with energy for the big game. The all nighter. In the days that act like nights, we work hard, play harder. We do it all bigger and better than the rest. Formulated with 300 milligrams of caffeine, Ultimate Energy packs an extra punch. It breaks boundaries. Just ask Lil Yachty, who uses C4 Ultimate Energy to help fuel him on tour this fall. Zero sugar, no artificial flavors. C4 Ultimate provides supercharged energy in delicious flavors, such as orange cream, fruit punch, freedom ice, Arctic snow cone. I love C4. Take C4 before I get on the Peloton. Take it before I hit the gym. C4 is great and it tastes awesome. C4 Ultimate Energy. Get supercharged at C4Energy.com or find it near you at findc4.com. I'm going to have some C4 Energy when I get home today. Squeeze in a quick workout before Monday Night Football. How about that? There you go. I worked out at 6 a.m. this morning. Thanks to C4. Mm -hmm. Thanks to C4. Training for Kenya, part two. All right, mid. Let's do rapid fire with Mincy. Just of like, let's let's see what his favorite things are okay. in the world. Okay, what's your favorite color? Red. For Ole Miss, I like the or, Ole Miss red because you're Republican. Uh, the Ole Miss red. Okay, um, I'm I'm not registered either side. I'm independent. Yeah, what do you think about politics? Actually, <laughs> okay, no. I, so I, I I've you, never heard you talk politics. Yeah, I haven't either. I try to. Well, first of all, I, I usually try to stay like I'm. People don't. You know, you're asking, so I'll talk about it. Usually I just like think I'm entertainment, so I try to stay away. But uh, I always was like back in the day, especially like the Republicans were against online poker and weed and all that. And so mm-hmm. I was like a little more left because I was like, people can do whatever they want to do, you mm-hmm. know. But then, you know, nowadays I, I, I feel like I'm pretty moderate in the middle. I feel like maybe I'm slanting a little bit right as the world's gotten crazier and crazier to the left, but like I'm not. You know, I'm definitely not far on either side. Okay, interesting. So yeah, I'm not. Mincy just, stayed the same. The the Overton yeah. window. <laughs> yeah, the, oh, yeah, yeah. I feel like I slanted right as the thing went so far. What do you think? What do you think about the uh, the invasion of Ukraine? Uh, oh, uh, I, 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 you know, I, I didn't see how. I don't know that that was like our our. You know, I, I don't know if that was like. I, I wish we worry more about our own problems than that. Uh huh. Yes. Are you pro or anti Putin? I'm, I'm whatever. Like, I, I don't know. I'm not going to say like, I'm like pro him or anything, but I, I'm more worried. It's a hot start. No, no. I'm just more, I'm more worried. Like we got a lot of problems in America Yeah, and we need to worry about our problems in America more than we need to worry about those. I, Agreed. I I'm for the record. I'm anti-Putin. I, yeah, and I don't like, I'm not I, saying I like Putin. I don't, I just, I just think that maybe, well, like you, say you don't him. like him. I'm, okay. I'm you don't like him, but I just, <laughs> You can be anti-Putin and I'm anti, also I'm anti-Putin, but we need to like we're sending billions to Ukraine when we can be like, our our big cities. Our cities are falling exactly. apart, Mincy. Thank you. Thank yep, <laughs> Mincy. Well, but we'll clean them up for President Xi. <laughs> yeah. If you could change uh, one thing, I don't like the border stuff either. <laughs> uh, yeah, come on. I don't. I don't like it. If, I, I don't preach like it. on it. If you could change uh, one thing about America, what would it be? One thing to change about like me. a law. So Mincy, Mincy gets Let, to be, less ta- less taxes. Yes, because okay. <laughs> I don't trust the yes. government. I don't trust the government to spend our like. I mean, like, why do I have to pay for this war in Ukraine? You know exactly. Like, why Mincy do I can, do or the uh, war but, in Israel too? Why we had to pay for that, right? I mean, Ooh. Uh, it, I, mean I got the, why? Uh, the, 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 the 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 my grandfather was Jewish. I got the Mets like, nice names. Yeah, the Israel stuff. Uh, yeah. Um, but just in general, like I just we need to worry about our own selves, not the world. All right. Mm-hmm. So if, if but if you were to change like one policy, um, like let's take taxes out of it. If you if mints were to be king for a day and you get to make one rule, 
and make something legal that's illegal in the United States right now, what would it be? Hmm. Yeah. Let me think on this. Or vice versa. Yeah. Or, make anything yeah. legal. We already have the, 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 the two stuff I talked about were the gambling and the weed, which are now kind of trending toward being legal. Mm-hmm. Like, cause that was always my thing. Like people are going to do whatever they want to do. So like, why are we, why are we uh, policing that? Um, I guess those would have been the two. Uh, what about shrooms? If they really helped you come to this second I think that, chapter, I'd be, you know, I, that they're where are they legal in Colorado and Oregon now. Oregon yeah. for sure. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that should be legal for sure. I don't think that's a big deal. Um, I think I, I just online. Places I wish online poker was like legal everywhere too. It's like legal in a few states, but like it was so awesome when the whole world played it. But now it's like one state mm. could play it. That sucks. What was that, Aaron? I was saying if there's anything like online like you can buy some like to to microdose but that's probably stupid to say publicly as i'm I, saying it i'm like i got I you i'm on the podcast <laughs> i got you yeah yeah the, no the drugs thing is interesting I, like on it like i i feel like i mean I, people are gonna do what they want to do you know i'm not saying that but like heroin shouldn't be legal i'm not saying that but amen but you know, I do feel like the the war on drugs has been a very large waste and locked up a lot of people that don't need to be in jail. And it's been a big the war on drugs has been incredibly stupid. Agreed. And cost tons of money and resources. And like Louisiana had the highest jail rate in America forever. I think it still does. And so many people are locked up for weed. Like, I mean, stupid as shit ever. Doesn't make any sense at all. No. Um, you talked earlier about, you know, in this next stage, the second act, you're, you're looking to at some point have a family, you're getting in good shape right now. You're taking your health very seriously. What are you looking for in a, in a partner? Cause you said some things earlier about, you know, not sure if marriage totally makes sense. If you're going to be growing, uh, does it make sense to grow together with somebody? Cause you might end up being a different person there at some point, but right now, what are you looking for? Uh, we might have some female listeners out there. I just want to be loved. Uh, yeah. you know, it's all about, you get older. It's interesting when you're younger, it's all about the one night thing and the, like the level of attraction. I just want to like be with somebody that's cool and compatible. Yeah. It'd be just cute. Cool. I mean, it'd be awesome if they were hot, but it, <laughs> I'll might, settle for cute. But yeah, I just want to yeah. be around someone that like, I can just be myself and feel comfortable. That's, that's a great perspective. I think because that's as you get, you know, as you get older, that's like more what it's about. Yeah. You just want to find somebody that, that you can love, that can love you, that, it's fun just to feel, well, Also, I'm like so quirky and weird. I, I like being around someone that I feel like I can be like that and just be myself. I know? think we almost need to do a Ben Men's Bachelor. I thought about that before. Like once I get the weight loss done, like I would be just unreal. Like the 200 pound me, like taking people to like Tim and Tina's and Nolan shows. Cause like going a different route with it. Cause I don't drink. Yeah. You know, going to like shows. sporting. I don't know. That would be fun. Yeah. yeah. Ben Men's the, the Bachelor. The Men, The Mensler. The Mensler, I like that. That'd be good. No, nah, I'm down for you know. Are, are there a lot of girls at widespread panic concerts, or is it like yeah, mostly yeah, they're men? older. It's it's just the older fan base now though, because okay. I'm going since the '80s. But yeah, they're cute girls. Okay. Favorite food in the world? Man, I like a lot of them. Uh, favorite food in the entire world? God dang, I love oysters. Love crawfish. Mincy has a great taste in food, I have to say. Yeah, no, I'm yes. the biggest. I'm one of the biggest. Donnie and I'm one of the biggest foodie. Even doing yeah. the low-carb thing, I take it. I still love food. You just got to get creative with it. Yeah. That was another all-time picture was your, your barbecue plate. With all the sugar on that it. That you took a picture of, and you're, you're like, I'm going low-carb. I don't think that no you intentionally sugar, yeah. did, I didn't intentionally do, do that, that one. one. That one was not so, Some of them I think you kind of lean into yeah, a yeah, little that bit. that one wasn't intentional. That one was just like no carbs on this plate. And there was what, like six, 60, 70 grams of sugar on there? Yeah, at least. Probably 150. <laughs> yeah. no, I've gotten to where the elite low carb meal is a wedge salad, a steak, and cream spinach. That's like the elite low carb one, I think, mm, if you're doing like a low carb, low carb diet. What's the. Uh, I, lo- I love ice cream, and that's like the thing I have to fight with sweet tooth. Like summertime yeah. ice cream is like a huge mint. So they especially mint chocolate chip, the namesake. Oh, uh, yeah. That's, <laughs> that's, a, that's a big, big problem. What's the, uh, what's the best feeling that you've ever had? best feeling i've ever had it's tough there's been a lot of really good ones uh i feel like i'll be honest i think one of the top ones i've ever had is coming with the saint jude house. what i i oh, okay. oh wow. hey oh, ben <laughs> oh what do you mean oh <laughs> uh, coming yeah come you, on you just time. said you just that was perfect. That was a perfect answer. Right. Okay. okay. Wait, no, but, uh, but some of the best I've had, I don't know, when I won all that money in poker, that, that was good. But getting hired by Barstool was super. Yeah. I mean, y'all saw how fired up I was and Dave hired me back. That was a yeah. That was a pretty pretty big highlight. Um, 
Yeah, there's some of them, man. There've been a lot of good ones though. I feel like I've gotten to enjoy life more than most. Yeah, what do you want? What do you want to accomplish at the end? Let's put it another like ten years from now. The year's twenty thirty three. You, ben Mintz is, how old? You'd be 49? I'd be, I'd be, yeah, I'd be 50 then. Be 50. Uh, what do you want to accomplish? I want to by... be in super good shape. Like, I want to be in, like, you know, really, really, you know, feeling good. <laughs> hopefully by then I'll have family. Um, and, you know, hopefully I still get to work with y'all. We'll see. You know, nobody knows what the future holds in media. Media changes every two years. Yeah. But uh, I know I work for the right company around the right people. I'm lucky as hell. I mean, I... I mean, it goes without saying, but like to have Dave as a boss, all the stuff he's done for me, I mean, unbelievable. What's beautiful for you is nobody is going to hire like, they're not hiring a specific one thing that Ben Mintz does. They're hiring Ben Mintz. Yeah, I get to be myself for a living and that's the luckiest thing of all time. Yeah. I mean, literally like my job is to be myself and just all the quirks and energy and everything. Mm -hmm. uh, I just get to, you know, take it to the people. And I'm lucky Dave sees the value in that. Like I'm the, just me being out in the South and being places and stuff is great. Yeah. Um, yeah. What is, uh, I had a question I was going to ask you a second ago. I lost my train of thought oh, no on it. Um, I was going to talk to you about the brick watch thing. Yeah. So are, we're still selling brick watches. Oh yeah. And I've actually, uh, you know, I've, I had a good 10 watch sale last, last week. Uh, okay. A store in Houston bought 10. Uh, we're going to oh, be doing shoot. a, a Black Friday, Cyber Monday, Brick Watch deal is coming. Talk to Dave about that today. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to be slinging some more. The Ole Miss thing's gone pretty well. Uh, so, you know, the Brick Watch thing, you know, I never really thought I'd be a watch salesman growing up. But, yeah. you know, you never know what's going to happen in life. But, you know, I think it's gone. It's definitely gone pretty well. What's your I, biggest fear? Oh, heights, man. God. Yeah, dude, I hear no, the, I hear when I was supposed to have to jump out of the freaking skydiving for that most dangerous game, yeah. that, that's a hell no for me. I'm ter I'm so so terrified of heights also would like not like to die alone if i could help that yeah nobody wants nobody wants, reasonable fear no, nobody yeah. wants to die alone you know yeah when you say die alone what do you mean yeah because everyone technically dies alone. well you know what i mean i just don't want to like i don't know like i feel i don't know you want to be surrounded by people yeah, just who love you when you yeah yeah, yeah. When, but, when you pass are you afraid yeah. of death like in the same room uh, I guess just more like that stage of life. Like that's more like a metaphor for like, I just don't want to be like an old lonely guy with no mm, yeah. people around. Uh, am I afraid of death? Uh, it used to be more, I was a lot more afraid of it before I became a Christian and believed in God. Amen. Uh, now I'm, I feel like it's just part of the process, mm -hmm. you know, but I feel like I'm happy with where I've taken my life. And, you know, it's funny because at 35, I had a lot of regrets, but I don't have a ton at 40. Like I feel like I've really fixed all the shit that was bad. Yeah. Going back to school, getting here, fixing my health, all that. And so, you know, I, it's nice to – I feel like I'm living life with no regrets. Well, I do have one that happened on May 1st. But, uh, but you know, in general, uh, for the most part, I'm, I have no regrets. Could um, you please explain to everybody your deal with the IRS if you want to? What do you mean? I don't know. I mean, I pay every month. I don't know. I have a monthly payment they get every month. I don't know. I pay my taxes. I mean, what are you going to do, you know? They take out five, you know, uh, every the tenth of every month they get some of my money. I don't know what to say. Mm -hmm. It's a fraudulent organization to begin with. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to do some voicemails. Would you mind sticking around to hear answer some people's voicemail of questions? All right, cool. Before this is, we this get is to so, those, so much fun. I appreciate it. It's brought to you by Nuts.com. That's right, Nuts.com. Cashews, almonds, pecans, pistachios, dried mango, crystallized ginger, dates, jelly beans, jawbreakers, root beer barrels. The variety is vast at Nuts.com. You like nuts? I do like nuts. I like nuts too. I do, yeah, I eat them instead of chips now. The Smart, second, yeah. Second act. Get get some almonds in there. Yeah, get some good fat. Good protein. Nuts.com is your one-stop shop for freshly roasted nuts, dried fruit, sweets, pantry staples. They have specialty flowers and much more. Wide selection, so that means that there's something for everyone. Nuts.com offers plenty of gluten-free options, organic choices, and other diet-friendly products. Whether you are looking for something sweet, savory, or need to stock up on everyday cooking essentials, you're bound to find something to try. At nuts.com, quality is top priority. They roast their nuts. They pop their corn the same day it ships. They reach you deliciously fresh. Satisfaction is guaranteed. I love a good root beer barrel. That's such an underrated candy. Mm, love it so much. Love everything from nuts.com. Check it out now. You can shop a la carte at any time, or you can opt into hassle-free auto deliveries so you never run out of your favorite items. And if you're already stocked up at home, they also sell directly to businesses. Right now, Nuts.com is offering new customers a free gift with purchase and free shipping on orders of $29 or more at nuts.com slash macro. It's a great deal. Check out all the delicious options 
nut.com slash macro. You get a free sh- free gift and free shipping when you spend $29 or more. That's nuts.com slash macro. The voicemail is also brought to you by BetterHelp. Mincy, I don't know if you've ever tried therapy before. The I, I, I should. I never have. But it's I, good for everybody. Oh, no. I, I'm definitely not against it. Talking's good, you know. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. Sometimes it, it, it helps to organize your thoughts by verbalizing them and by getting feedback from um, a, a trained licensed mental health care provider. And especially around this time of year, that can be a lot. And Macrodosing is sponsored by BetterHelp. It's natural to feel some sadness or some anxiety about this time of year. I know the sun goes down super early now. That's rough. Not necessarily the greatest thing for mental health. You got family coming into town. You're traveling. There's a lot of pressures that add up around the holiday. But adding something new and positive to your life can counteract some of those feelings. Therapy can be a bright spot amid all the stress and the change. Something to look forward to. Make you feel grounded. And to give you the tools to manage everything going on. I've personally benefited from therapy. I think a lot of people out there could. I've uh, gone to a therapist during times of loss before. It helps you to organize your thoughts. If you're making a big change in your life, sometimes there's a lot of stress that can go along with that. And talking to a therapist is a great way to alleviate some of that stress. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire. You're going to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash dose today. Get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp.com slash dose. BetterHelp.com slash dose. All right, we're going to get in some voicemails. Mad Dog, do we have those ready? Yep. Okay, yeah, so Mints, feel free to jump in. We don't know what they're going to ask, but uh, <laughs> they're always wild. What's up, guys? This is uh, Adam from California. I'm currently at work using my headphones, so I'm sorry if it sounds bad. But my main question is I just need some advice, not on, like, a particular thing, but, like, just in general. Most of the time when I talk to, like, anybody, I'm fine even girls or anything like that but like as soon as i think they have like any interest in me at all i'm just like the biggest bitch of all time it's just i don't know i I feel like i just turn into like a fucking a hermit crab i just like do nothing i don't know so like what's something that could what would you say something that has helped you guys get over like feeling like you're not good enough but yeah that's my question i have to get back to work i don't want to look crazy talking my headphones so love you guys thanks for the podcast you guys are awesome all right thank you for the call i'm this seems like one arian might be able to help out with arian's had some legitimately good advice to our callers the last few weeks thank you eric um welcome arian (laughs) Um, I, I've I've never personally struggled with this, right? Like, I, I think this is a confidence thing, right? I've never personally struggled with like not being able to be myself around like females. Um, and it was I guess it's a little bit of an ego too, because anytime like a woman would reject me, I would never take it personally. I'd be like, oh, there's something wrong with you, or it is what it is. You know what I'm saying? I just never took it personally. I'd be like, it is what it is. I guess I guess that's that's where the confidence stems from is like keeping in perspective there's eight billion people in the world. It's insane to think everybody's gonna like me, right? And so just find solace in the fact that the, the ones that do, that's a that's a dope marriage, right? And so when it comes to like courting women and stuff like that. Women, depending on their looks as well, as well, like they have so many options, right? They have so many options because it's like the men have to do the courting, right? We have to do the for the major for the majority of of dating. I'm not speaking in I'm speaking in broad terms, but um, so I, I guess I guess it's just a confidence thing and knowing like though you like you are like you are somebody somebody eventually right somebody gonna find you attractive somebody gonna find you funny somebody because there's too many people with different personalities so I guess just don't take it personal and like 
I, I guess confidence to me is like I guess like how, how I instill confidence in my kids. Um is like I find little things. I'm not calling my, my man as a kid. I'm just saying like when you have when you struggle with confidence, this is like the best thing that I've seen. It's like when people struggle with confidence, they it's usually like a stems from like past of, of like nobody bigging you up. Like if you did something small. Like if my kids do something small, I'm like, that's crazy good. That's dope as hell. And after a while, they feel good about that. And after, and then the, that can lead to something else and something else. And after a while, they start walking around like, I could do whatever I want to do because look how good I've I've been. You know, like I'm a track record of doing shit that works. And you, if you don't have nobody around you to big you up like that, you got to big yourself and be kind to yourself, right? Like, shit, dog, like. I'm, I'm out here on my own. I got a job. I'm doing my own thing. I'm yeah, like, like that kind of stuff. Like start being kind to yourself in that regards. And that'll, that'll slowly give you confidence. And you start realizing, man, sometimes interactions with people in general, not just females, <laughs> but dudes in general, sometimes interaction with people in general has nothing to do with you about how they react to you. It got nothing to do with you. Like somebody else's opinion is none of your business. Like that kind of feel. So I think it's a confidence thing, my brother. And I think if you just slowly start to build your own confidence, if you don't have like a village to, to, to help you build your confidence and to be honest with it about it and to tell them that like sit down and build with your people like dog I'm struggling with confidence and be like nah bro like, like look at this shit that you do good you know what I'm saying like if they're not then just start slowly doing it yourself and you'll see that you probably are accomplishing a lot more than you give yourself credit for and that can slowly bleed into like your daily life and everything else so that's what I would say my guy I got something there's a specific part something he said that he was fine talking to people it was just until he thought a girl was interested in him something when you're like freezing up like that because uh there's like various different situations uh where you freeze up it might be you know in a job interview like because there's so much at stake and something that i found personally uh to help with that sort of anxious freezing up is uh, exposure therapy so just think about it like it's, this is a, ther I'm not a therapist, but this is a therapy technique that was conveyed to me that if you imagine like what happens, like if you go like, what's the worst thing that happens? You talk to this girl, you know, she's interested in you. Let's say she rejects you. <laughs> worst thing that can happen. Like she ha holds nothing against you. You know, you bit too early. You thought she was into you. That's the worst thing. Take it further. You're into this girl. She's into you. You go home with her and then she just ends up like something happens. You start having a relationship. She dumps you. you. Just think of the worst possible case scenario, but like really envision it. And then over and over, by the time you're talking to him, you'll realize that it's very inconsequential that, you know, the worst case scenario will not ruin you, will not kill you. Like it takes the stakes of, you know, interacting with that one person down a hundred percent. And you like through that sort of, exposure technique you're able to make things much less consequential and condition your mind to not give you a fear response uh, and that you know freeze up response when you're talking to them and also work out for confidence yeah i was gonna i was gonna add i don't want to yuck real quick i don't want to yuck billy's yum um but like it sounds like you're saying like before you talk to a girl, no, think about her. No, no, not you, not right like before. Her, like, just like in, <laughs> and, and then you'll realize that'd be stupid if that happened, and then you'll be like, oh, what? I don't have no, anything no. To lose. This is like, me. for example, go home. Like if you're really worried about this and you want to work on yourself, go home, write down the worst things you think can happen, read it back to yourself, write like a story of like the worst possible scenario, read it back to yourself until you realize how ridiculous you're sounding. And that will actually help you sort of when you get in that situation, not freeze up. Um, yeah, I don't disagree with that. One, one more thing I, I, I will add um, is what I found is to be completely honest. Like, with, like say a girl does so interest in you, like just be honest. Be like, hey, listen, like I'm not good at this. Like I, I, I'm interested in you as well, but I'm just not good at this. So I just want to like let it, you know, let that be known. Like, so if I come off a little awkward it's because I'm nervous, whatever I'm saying. Like a lot of times they find the honesty flattering. It's like, oh, you know what I'm saying? That's that's dope. Whether or not she is experienced, I think she'll find it, you know, endearing that that she gives you that feeling. You know what I mean? That that honesty might break the ice, honestly. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. And and to build confidence in yourself, like Aaron was talking about, like finding things you do well if you don't have a group of friends that is like able to gas you up like that. Um, just set like small goals for yourself. 
and accomplish small goals, whether that's like you guys were saying, working out, like go to the gym three times this week and then check that off. And you will gain confidence because it's three things that you've said that you're going to do that you end up doing. Or if it's like uh, if you're studying for something like set aside time, okay, here's what I'm going to do from this time to that time. If it's even just like waking up early uh, and getting a head start on your, on your day, like set tiny goals for yourself, accomplish those tiny goals, and you'll start to get like a natural boost of confidence behind it. Now, my thing, I actually have something to add on this. Uh, I want to back <laughs> what Billy said because I've gone through this in life. Like there's a direct correlation to when you're healthy or unhealthy with the women thing. Like I've gone through years and I'm like way overweight or just worried about poker and have like no opportunity for a few years. But like when my confidence and energy is high and I'm working out and feeling good, opportunities everywhere. And so it's – you're lying to yourself – if you look in the mirror and you don't like what you see, you're lying to yourself if you don't do something about it. Mm-hmm. It's a real thing. And like, I would block it out. I'd make a mountain into a molehill, like lying to myself about it. Like you put, it's like interesting with your brain. Like if some, you know, you got like a real problem, but you don't want to face it. You like hide it in the back of your brain. But then when you do that, instead of facing your problems head on, they become it, bigger and bigger and bigger. Mm-hmm. And like the women thing, like, man, the, you know, the working out, taking care of yourself, feeling healthy, feeling energetic, it breeds confidence, it breeds energy, and women like success. Bro, and energy. if you get yeah. a chest pump, go to the gym, get some beta alanine, drink a C4, get a chest pump and a bicep pump, and you're going to walk out of there feeling like the man. Like, seriously, it's just, it's chemical. Yeah. The endorphins rush, the actual pump that you get, like... That's the meathead solution, but also try the exposure therapy. Read up on it. it it's it's a proven uh, method to stop the freeze ups, including to- like stuff with like test taking uh, and all sorts of stuff. Try to get out of your own head too. So if you're talking to a girl and like, don't just be constantly thinking, oh my God, I think she likes me. I think she likes me. Just try to zero in and just focus on the conversation you're having with her. Because anytime I've been too in my own head, it never helps. Just mm-hmm. focus on the here and now of what you're actually doing, which is having a conversation with a girl. Ooh, last last answer, thing. Yeah. Don't do the thing that your buddy's going to tell you to like have another drink and just like get a little loose with it because you're going to end up talking to her and being hammered and it's not going to help you. I agree, Billy. Good. That's a good point. Billy, are you the guy that tells the other, <laughs> other guys? No, to no, get drink? no. It's it's a it's a. Sometimes it's like sometimes you see your friend literally have bugging out, and you're like, "Yo, dude, just like rip a shot or something, chill out." But like it, it's it's not. So yes, the, the right answer, answer. <laughs> Mackenzie, Mad Dog. Billy just said no, and then explained. Well, well no, yes, it's a short. Right, I mean, right, right. short term <laughs> might work, but it's score. a very low percentage. <laughs> Better do the exposure therapy and get a bicep pump and squats. Squats. And squats. Squat yeah. your way out of it. Yeah. Mm. Billy taught me how to squat. I've been feeling so much more confident these days. <laughs> That's yeah. true. Yeah. Got an ass pump. Man, yeah. I just started squatting again. I ain't squatted in years, dog. It turns I'm out I was doing it completely. Sore, bro. I am fucking sore. Like, what are you putting up, Aaron? I only go to 135. Well, you're only squatting 135? I'm up. What? Okay, sorry, 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 Turkey's got big chest. Turkeys can't breed. Hey, guys. Uh, just want to ask PFT a question. Did you jinx JMU this weekend by going on a game day? Question. Anyway, everyone say <laughs> handsome, beautiful. Good night. All right. Good question. Thank you for that question. No, I did not jinx JMU. I didn't jinx JMU. I regret nothing. I said what I wanted to say. I stuck my chest out there. I will not apologize for supporting my school, trying to amp the crowd up. I had a great time. It was unfortunate that we lost. Now, in retrospect, looking at me on national television saying, like, I'm ready to declare a national championship if we happen to go undefeated, that doesn't age well. I'll agree with that, but I don't think it had anything to do with the loss. I think that had more to do with the referees looking at that video play review and saying, no, that was a touchdown into the game. That's what I think. Okay. All right. Last one. Yep. 
Okay. Hey, Macrodosing crew. This is Adam from Richmond, Virginia. I have a question for Billy Football and Arian Foster. I was listening last week, and somebody asked if PFT and Arian ever disagreed on anything. My question is, do Billy Football and Arian Foster agree on anything? I couldn't exactly hear him. Could you repeat Thank you. Love y'all. Stay beautiful. It's, do you and Arian agree on anything? He said last week me and PFT had to answer do we disagree on anything? Me and you gotta answer do we agree? I think we probably agree on a lot of things. Yeah, we agree on most of just the silly shit you be saying is a disagreement. (laughs) Um like the aliens in the middle of the earth and shit like that. But other than the shit like that, I think it's like you're pretty I don't like you're a libertarian that leans left. Um so I think like, I think you're well. You might not be well, Matt. Like with the drug law. No, I'm I'm full for full legalization. So you yeah, think yeah, because, legal? okay, yeah okay. I mean, look at Spain, Portugal. Like there should be safe injection sites because it would actually solve the homeless issue. Like, yeah. we you know if there's safe injection sites, you know then a lot of the homeless who just choose to the only reason they a lot of the reasons why they don't go to shelters is because you can't use drugs there. But if they, you have a place where they can go, that's also a place where you can uh, help them find help, help them ha- get clean supplies, check their uh, stuff and T yeah, levels. T- <laughs> you say T levels. Yep. That's actually a serious <laughs> issue with, with yeah, drug, at, with uh, drug use is you do lower your natural testosterone production, which causes you to use more drugs because you're trying to feel normal, but your hormone I would highly recommend. Uh, never mind. Get your hormones checked. Highly, you never know. Like a lot of yeah. mental health problems are because of unbalanced hormones. I'm actually with Billy on that one. Yeah, sure. Yeah. No, we. Yeah, so we you're going I'm sure there's more stuff we agree on too. Mm-hmm. Okay. I'm positive there's more stuff we agree on too. I think I give you a lot of shit, um, but I also think you play a bit, and I usually swat that shit down it's not fun to talk about stuff Um, you agree on it's fun to argue see that's what you (laughs) have been talking about but uh i think we agree more often than not um honestly i think he just as soon as he drops his bit then we 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 we, because when we when we when i'm in person we out somewhere and about he's a different billy man but this billy this billy yeah we're gonna have some we're gonna have some fades verbally it's fair. All right. Anything else you want to uh, get off your chest, Mets? Uh, I just want to say I'm going to throw up a donation link uh, for the St. Jude half. Uh, look, you know, there's nothing more noble than supporting kids that have child cancer. St. Jude's, uh, St. Jude, anybody that's there doesn't have to pay a cent for their treatment. Uh, and, uh, you know, obviously I feel like I've been given this platform that I'm trying. I mean, I know it sounds cheesy, but I want to do some good in the world with it. And so, you know, I'm going to try to do some fundraising. I believe Dave's Dave's told me he's going to get involved with it, which I think is awesome. And I'm going to throw a link up for it. I'm going to be going. I'm going to wait till after Cyber Black Friday, Cyber Monday to make a big push on it late next week. But, okay. uh, you know, obviously a lot's happened this year, to put it mildly. And uh, I think this is a positive way to end it. All right. Let's go. Anyone else? Anything else mm-hmm. we want to get into today? Um, Black Friday is this week. It sure is. And we would really appreciate if you guys bought macrodosing merch. We do have some fire merch. Mm-hmm. We do. We got and some fire stuff coming out. Also, me and Mackenzie would really appreciate if you guys bought macrodosing merch because if Barstool hits their goal, then anything after that gets split amongst all the producers. Um, and we would really appreciate if you guys would help us out. We had we filmed a very funny video mm. um, promoing it that I'll put up this weekend. But um, if Big, you guys, Big T helped us with that. Yeah. Featuring Big T. Yeah, thank you, Big T. Um, but yeah, Black Friday through like Cyber Monday will be on the telethon. All of the guys will be on the telethon. Me and Mackenzie are going to be on the telethon doing producer stuff. But if you guys could buy some macrodosing merch and help Mackenzie and I out, that'd rock. There you go. They work very hard and they could make some good money here. And also, if you're if you're looking to buy merch, 
there's going to be some big discounts. Mm. So mm-hmm. Right. It'll if, be, it's Black Friday. So yeah. it'll be, I think the whole store is 20% off the whole weekend. If you've thought about purchasing, now's the time to do it mm-hmm. coming up this Friday. Christmas gifts. Because, it, yeah, great for Christmas gifts. Mm-hmm. And the entire store is on sale. And we don't do sales like this, but once a year. So if you're on the fence about it, now's the time to act. Plus, you get the added bonus of putting some money in Mad Dog and McKinsey's pockets. <laughs> Thank you. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so we would really appreciate that. And me and Mackenzie filmed a very funny video that I'll send to you guys. Also, there right. may be a Ugandan football t-shirt coming out, jersey type thing to help contribute Ooh. to uh, the Ugandan American football team. Lots of good causes nice. to support. Yes, yeah. and that would probably also help support your return to Africa. Yeah, let's talk so, about that real quick. Because uh, Billy's, Billy's going I can't, I can't Here's what I've here. heard. Those dudes... Are- I've, I've, <laughs> can't stay away it's like I've, Chris Kyle and American Sniper after his tour he goes back to normal life and he was like I can't I can't do normal life anymore Billy can't fit into civilian ways yeah. Billy I, I heard from the highest of levels that you're putting together a budget yes. for this trip so have you done um, the budget I have yet? the flights uh, basically it's hard to find some of the pricing from some of the stuff we used uh, last time because like for example Donnie did is there like a website for the apartments we stayed in? Yeah, I, I can help you put well, together. I, I just need a, a budget. Uh, I'm gonna make it very uh, low cost for the practice, but hopefully, Donnie then meets me in Nairobi and we can coach the Ugandan team to a win on Kenyan soil and hopefully save the program because if they go zero and two, the sports minister, uh, the the American football team in uganda isn't the highest priority of the ugandan government and if they have some success no. uh, it's more than likely in 2024 their budget uh you know they'll be in the sports budget of the country so you know winning is okay. it's you know it's not just about spreading the sport in order to we got to win to save this program so i'm going to be going over there okay. with footballs um hopefully we can uh get more pads I, I was thinking about talking to Donnie about this right after, but uh, hopefully we can get some more equipment for them and I'm going to head over there and bring it. And uh, hopefully we can have a better result than last time. Also, I'm going to be hosting an East African uh, referee association meeting in Nairobi in order to help train refs uh, there because, you know, football is one of those sports where you really do need uh, structure to play the game. I can't wait to yeah. see that footage. Me too. Well, and the the players on our team really love the sport, so we want to give them more opportunities to play. Also, I mean, those guys love football more than like they don't take football for granted. A lot of people in the U- U.S. like high school players, they show up and they're like going through the motions. Like these guys play every down, like it's gonna like it's the greatest thing on earth, and it might get taken away with from them, which it might. So, uh, I'm gonna be heading back once I put this budget together. And uh, hopefully we can bring back a better outcome than last time. All right. Well, stay tuned for all that. Mens, thank you for joining yeah, thank, us. Today. I just want to say thank you all. This is a lot of fun. Uh, really enjoyed it. Really appreciate yeah. my relationship with everybody here. Good to, good to get to chop it up with Aaron and Billy as well. Yeah, you got to unload the clip. Yeah. All right, Love my nigga. <laughs> <laughs> I, got, I got nothing. <laughs> All right, we'll see you guys. Have a happy Thanksgiving. Make sure to celebrate Thanksgiving for all that it's worth and really lean into how great of a holiday Thanksgiving is because keep it's throwing, awesome. Keep throwing shots, man. Nobody keep tell me shots. Merry Christmas until next great. week. Mm-hmm. Only great. time to eat stuffing Be- all year. The one great thing, Thanksgiving, whoever made it a Thursday, yeah. it's awesome. Yeah. That's one of the best because you get the whole weekend. That's yep. a great call. You know, the, the Thursday thing it may be Got the it. best thing about it. This yep. thing. We're grateful weekend. for you, Macrodosians. Thank you guys so much. <laughs> grateful for you guys good point billy i'm thankful for everybody that wakes up and and chooses to click on a button that has our voices streaming into whatever device they use into their ears i'd never take that for granted so thank you guys i appreciate you all I i'm appreciate thankful everybody for you guys yeah. too, and everybody on zoom yeah mm-hmm. so thanks to everyone well, here we're not we're not in the room he kind of slid. i said and everyone here i added on to <laughs> that i'm just saying i'm just saying I'm, I'm, saying. I'm thankful for arian foster so thankful Aww. for Eric. Thank you, Eric. All right. See you guys next week. Love you guys. Mm.